Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, Lakewood City Council virtual meeting of July 12th, 2021 um, at 7 p.m. For those wishing to engage tonight, the phone number is 1-669-900-9128. Webinar ID of 982-4181-2727. Pound, and then you'll press pound again. When it's the time to speak, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and unmute by pressing star six. I would like to acknowledge, and we'll certainly do this as we go through the agenda, all those that have weighed in via Lakewood Speaks. I think we probably had over 40 or 50 different folks weigh in, and, and certainly there were some questions that were asked as well. So make sure on those agenda items, we try to get your questions answered. So with that, Mr. Clerk, if you'd please read the roll. Paul. Here. Abel. Uh, Vincent. Here. Gutwine. Here. Beta. Here. Skilling. Here. Springsteen. Here. Franks. Here. Johnson. Here. Lebeer. Here. And Harrison. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, sir. So I'll now ask that you please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll remain uh, standing for a moment of silent prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. All right, next up we have a uh, general public comment. This is the point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the city council on items that did not appear on the agenda. All comments should be directed to the city council. I ask that all persons calling in observe the same decorum of a city council meeting held in person in the chambers. Again, the call in number tonight is 669-900-9128. With the webinar ID of 982-4181-2713. Pound, pound, uh, star nine to request to speak, star six to unmute. You will have three minutes when your name or last four digits are called. Please give us your name and address or name and ward. And I will start your three minutes when there is 30 seconds left. I will let you know and then politely wrap you up at three minutes. Again, this is general public comment. Mr. Clerk. 3524. Caller 3524, good evening. If you give us your name and address or name and ward, we'll get you started. Star six to unmute. Caller 3524, star six to unmute, please. Good evening. Good evening. This is Haley Slammon from Ward 2. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Excellent. Sorry. Star 6 did not work the first time. That's cool. Good evening, council members. I'm actually calling to voice my extreme disappointment with Mayor Adam Paul's behavior at the previous city council meeting on June 28th. The council was specifically asked during public comment at the last meeting to respect the ideas and voices of all members, because when you silence a representative, you silence all the people they represent. Not 10 minutes later, Mayor Paul decided to pick a shouting match with council member Anita Springsteen because she voiced concerns not all public comments had been heard, muting her multiple times, eventually leading to a six minute recess. I have regularly been attending city council meetings with my mother since I was 10. This was one of the most childish moments I've experienced during a meeting in the 15 years since then. The mayor is not a dictator with a mute button, and the respectful and dignified decorum in that moment would have been quickly listening to the point of order, not attempting to shut up a colleague at the cost of all of our time. 
As a female viewer, I also found it incredibly demeaning and sexist to try to make Council Member Springsteen silence herself by muting her, as well as further scolding her later in the meeting, saying she was not respecting the public's time because of her opinion that taking medical, taxing medical marijuana was a ridiculous thing to be put on the council agenda to discuss. It's embarrassing to try to teach my less informed housemates about the importance of local politics when this is our local atmosphere. In a place where the city manager and police chief's lakewood.org emails aren't even listed on the city website, the last thing the council should be doing is dismissing concerns or ideas because they aren't presented properly. I think that Mayor Paul owes Council Member Springsteen and the public an apology for his time wasting and disrespect. I would hope that he considers better ways to wield the power voters choose to give him in future. Thank you for listening. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Next, Mr. Clerk. Joshua Comden. All right, Mr. Comden, your name and address or ward and we'll get you going. Hello, my name is uh, Joshua Comden. I'm in Ward 1, and I just want to call again to express um, a hope and support that you might uh, get a citizen review board of the Lakewood Police Department. I know that the issue of body cams is coming down the pipeline with them going to be implemented soon. And I think the governor recently signed a, a bill that would... Uh, require that under any allegation that those videos be released. And I know at some point there's going to have to be a policy change uh, to allow this to happen in Lakewood. And if you had the citizen review board, that might be a very good avenue to get some policy made. So uh, thank you for your time. And I hope you would consider that in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next. If you wish to speak under general public comment, please raise your hand, star nine. General public comment. Okay, well, looks like a hand came up. Yeah. Again, if you wish to speak under general public comment, please raise your hand now so we can get to you and make sure you don't get skipped. This will be 4375. All right, 4375, name and address, name and ward, and we'll get you three minutes. Hi there. Um, thank you for holding this space for um, us to come forward and speak. Um, my name is Tess, and um, I'm calling tonight uh, to um, reiterate what previous callers have said um, regarding the Citizen um, Review Board. I think that it would be very helpful um, given recent events and just a history of um, accountability um, with the Lakewood Police, despite them having one of the, um, you know, highest requirement thresholds, um, as evidenced by a recent video I saw that was put out um, about the, you know, the college, the four-year college degree requirement, and um, in their, you know, fairly extensive compared to other um, police academies in the United States, um, their extensive training program. But you know, it doesn't seem something seems to be off, and so um, because we're not seeing the results of that. And so um, I would like to see the Citizen Review Board as well. And, um, and I also think that um, it was appalling what happened um, at that meeting that was referenced by the um, caller right before the last one. And um, I do think that, you know, as I think that the public and Anita deserve um, an apology because it was, it was absurd what went on. And, you know, I also think that I would call upon the other council members to, um, you know, that there's some sort of complicity that's happening. You know, I mean, why were, why is no one else spoken up about this? Why, why was that allowed to happen? Um, and so, you know, there are, there's a level of accountability that needs to be um, maintained and needs to be reached with everybody in, on this call. And, um, and, you know, in, in, these positions that y'all are in and that um, you hold a lot of power. And if that's the demonstration of, you know, what you're going to do with that power, then um, I'm, you know, it's very concerning. Um, I also would, you know, like to point out that I'm kind of confused about, um, you know, some details of um, the case with Amir Allen, what is going on and not only in the courtroom, but in, um, but, but it, with the entire case is just, 
some of the most blatant corruption and cover up that I've ever witnessed. 30 seconds. Um, and so, you know, I just want to continue to reiterate that if y'all are choosing to ignore this, this is an injustice. And an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So, you know, we ha- like this is the, this is our job. It is our duty. It is our responsibility to speak up about these types of things. And remaining silent, you know, is violence. And that is you're, you are complicit with the oppressor. So please, please do something. Great. Thank you. Anybody else under general public comment? Okay, seeing none, I will close general public comment and we'll move into Ms. Hodson's executive report. Yes, thank you, good evening. Um, A couple of things, Um, as a follow-up from our July 4th holiday event, um, on an average day in July, Jeff Com. Um, which, of course, is the emergency communication um, regional center that we're a part of. And when I say regional, it's um, JeffCon serves and takes emergency calls for every agency in the county, including the county. So on an average day in July, um, we receive about 723 calls throughout the county. This year, 2021, on the 4th of July, we received 1,085 calls. So an average day in July is 723, and this year on the 4th of July, we received 1,085. Again, that's for the whole county. That number is actually down 246 calls from 2020. Just for your information, it's still a lot of calls, 1,085, but it's down 246. JeffCom accredits that to the extensive campaigns that both JeffCom and the partner agencies um, employed, as well as the local media's emphasis, excuse me, on on saving 911 calls for life or death emergencies. So just an update, we can, if you're interested, we can certainly provide additional information as our analysts are are, um, gathering that together. Excuse me. Um, Yes, one of the callers mentioned that the body cam program is underway. And as a matter of fact, our HR department has recently started a recruitment for some of the tech positions. So we have a body, this will help to build the body cam team. And this one, this position that's open now is for an equipment tech. Um, And that position will be responsible for inspecting, managing, and tracking the camera equipment. Just an update, we're starting to build the team to to be able to serve this entire body cam program. (laughs) Excuse me. Okay, additionally, we've got some nice improvements happening currently at Westland Park. If you haven't been to Westland Park, it's a very small park. In Ward 1, its address is 10890 West 17th Avenue. And here's what you'll see if you go to that park. You'll see a brand new playground, a pedestrian bridge across the, di- across the ditch. You'll see new landscaping and a couple of benches. And as a matter of fact, that new park or the new amenities to the park actually opens this week. And finally, um, at our last council meeting, we talked about um, the hybrid city council, starting to have hybrid city council meetings. And that schedule has been set. The RFPs are due on July 23rd, and the bid will be awarded on July 27th. So the work will begin in August and hopefully will conclude shortly thereafter, and as soon as we're ready to announce that date, we'll let you know ASAP, and we'll start our new format, which will be a hybrid format. So it'll be some in person and still um, the availability of the virtual format as well. So those are my four things for this evening, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so moving on to item six, and that is the motion to extend the emergency declaration. So I certainly have heard from some of you the question being that the governor has lifted the emergency declaration for the state. However, I've been asked to uh, present this tonight for another extension to July 26th because twofold, you heard Ms. Hodson say uh, that we're waiting on our hybrid. And the second part would be a change that the city attorney is bringing forward 
for our uh, uh, meetings to be held virtually without the emergency. So we need to continue at this, this phase. Hopefully this will be our last extension, um, but there could be one more after this and that'll get us through with new language for the city council to adopt that allows for virtual meetings going forward, um, as well as the technology to bring us to the hybrid resolution. So with that, I'll ask the mayor pro tem to please make a motion. I move to extend the declaration of disaster in the city of Lakewood, Colorado, resulting from the coronavirus slash COVID-19 pandemic, pursuant to section 1.27 of the Lakewood Municipal Code, originally declared by a proclamation of Lakewood City Manager on March 17th, 2020, extended by majority vote of the City Council on multiple occasions, and by this motion extended again until July 26, 2021, unless earlier extended or terminated by the city council. Second. Motion and a second, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, I'm curious, the amount of money that it's gonna to take to do the hybrid by keeping us in emergency status, is that what the reasoning is for that? Uh, Councillor, so let me take a no. The, to keep us in that status is we are allowed to have virtual meetings via our emergency rules. And once this declaration is gone without a change to our policies and procedures, which Ms. McKinney Brown is working on to bring forward to us, we wouldn't be allowed to uh, have these meetings without the emergency declaration. I think the dollars that are gonna be associated uh, Ms. Hodson are within the threshold of, of you to go ahead and do without council action. Um, that's accurate. And we'll have more information when we see how the bids come in, which will be by the end of this month, as I mentioned. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, please cast your votes. And that passes nine ayes, two nays, the nays being uh, Councillors Johnson and Springsteen. Next up is the consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda has been made to expedite council action. It contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances. Resolutions are items of a routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of their proposed resolutions. First reading ordinances are uh, set for the purpose of uh, setting future public hearing dates and ordering newspaper publication of the proposed ordinance. No public comments will be heard this evening on first reading ordinances. Um, the public will have the opportunity to comment on the proposed ordinances during the scheduled public hearings on the date set tonight by city council. Any council member may request an item on the consent agenda be removed for separate discussion and action under general business. Will the clerk please read the consent agenda into the record? Item seven, resolution 2021-29, authorizing the purchase of real property from Roger Guzman for open space and park purposes, including acceptance of a deed therefore. Item eight is resolution 2021 34, revisiting the fee schedule for contractor registrations. Item nine, ordinance O 2021-20, amending title two, chapter 2.56 of the municipal code of the city of Lakewood, Colorado, in connection with the permanent establishment of a fourth subcommittee to the Lakewood Advisory Commission concerning diversity and other general amendments. Item 10 is approving minutes of city council meetings. And item 11 is accepting minutes of the boards and commissions. Thank you. I'll now open the public hearing on the resolutions that are contained in the consent agenda, items seven and eight. There were staff presentations on Lakewood Speaks. If there are questions for council, we can certainly go back to those. So I'll now uh, ask the clerk if there's anybody in the audience that wishes to comment only on resolution 2021-29 or 2021-34, please raise your hand, which is star nine. I'm seeing none. Okay, going once, going twice for the consent agenda. All right, I'll close public comment on the resolutions on the consent agenda. I will now ask for a motion. 
I move for the approval of the city council minutes, acceptance of the minutes of the boards and commissions and order all ordinances introduced on first reading to be published in the Denver Post with public hearings set for the date included in the ordinance and for the adoption of resolutions, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk. Second. Okay, motion to second. Any questions? Okay, any comments? I just have one comment and that is again on 2021-29 uh, acquisition of park purchase. I wanna thank the community for reaching out uh, and sharing their comments. This is an important area. I wanna thank the community for allowing us to keep these Tabor dollars and uh, putting these to use for park purposes is which is what you had asked. So I'm, I'm anxious to support this and I know uh, Councilors LeBeer and Vincent are um, eager to see this park developed eventually and uh, it'll be a great amenity for an area that does not have a lot of parkland. Councilor Johnson, your hand is up. Thank you. I, I too support this, but I do have a question. After we use the money for the park purchase, how much money will be left in the Tabor Fund afterwards? Okay, so if we don't have an answer for that tonight, we'll certainly get that back to you. Uh, I think that there was uh, some information a while back, so that should be readily available if it's not with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Please cast your votes. The consent agenda passes 11 ayes, zero nays. Moving on to item 12, I'll please ask the clerk to read resolution 2021-35 into the record. Yes, a resolution approving a chapter 14.27 blight designation pursuant to chapter 14.27 of the Lakewood Municipal Code for the properties located at 955 through 999 Sheridan Boulevard in Lakewood, Colorado. Okay, I'll now open the public hearing on resolution 2021-35 um, and ask anybody who wishes to speak to please raise your hand. And I will also note that there were probably, I think on this one, 24 or 25 comments on Lakewood Speaks. And I think they were all in support. Mr. Clerk? We have Doug uh, Alonowitz, maybe? Yeah. Mr. Alonowitz, if you want to give us uh, your name or, or work address or ward, we'll get you three minutes started. Uh, hi, this is Doug Alonowitz. Uh, I, uh, my office address is 802 East 19th Avenue, Denver, and I'm a property owner in Ward 2. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, this council has been very supportive of the work that myself and my colleagues have done in developing the Westline Village project uh, over there in Ward 2 and immediately across the street from this property. I think we've discussed this particular property at numerous times over the years, and I'm very, very happy to throw my support behind uh, the blight designation to see uh, the opportunity to really make a very dramatic and very visible change for the good in the uh, city of Lakewood and in Ward 2. So uh, I just wanted to comment and encourage uh, support in the passing of this resolution. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Please raise your hand, star nine. Star nine, if anybody else wishes to speak on this agenda item. Okay, I'll close public comment. Um, there was uh, no presentation on Lakewood Speaks. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Smith in a minute. I just wanna reemphasize as we've gone through a few of these, uh, Mr. Smith is just presenting the facts and the applicant is here to present those findings. This is part of um, uh, uh, the process that city council laid out and that is why we are here Tonight, I will also mention 
that uh, Councilor Bita will have a, an amendment that I do believe he sent to council earlier today. So with that, Mr. Smith, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very kindly, Mayor and uh, members of City Council. Thanks for having us the opportunity to, to work on this particular resolution. Um, as you know, I do a short introduction and then uh, let folks uh, talk about the, uh, the condition study um, that the, the condition study was actually part of the Lakewood Speaks. It wasn't a, a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, before the council is resolution 2021-35 um, concerning a chapter 1427 blight designation, uh, consideration for the properties at 955 and 999 Sheridan Boulevard. Um, we'll have the consultant run through the main points of the blight study report in just a moment. That consultant is Ricker Cunningham. Um, they are a leading real estate advisory firm. They're based here in Denver. They established their practice in uh, 1993 uh, under the name of uh, Leland Consulting Group. Uh, they rebranded to Ricker Cunningham in 2012. So they've been around quite a while and they're very knowledgeable about the urban renewal process. Uh, Lakewood's 1427 blight process is nearly identical uh, to the urban renewal blight process. There are a few uh, differences, but uh, in many ways it's very, very similar. Uh, the condition survey and blight study, as I mentioned, was included in the packet along with a staff memo. That staff memo refers to Lakewood's resolutions 2020-7 and 2020-24. Those were council approved in, in uh, 2020 uh, and they helped to define blight for the purposes of chapter 1427. So there's a table in the, uh, the staff report that has 11 items on it. It starts at the page two um, and those 11 items must uh, be satisfied um, before these kinds of blight considerations can come forward to council. I won't run through all 11 of them. I'll just mention a couple uh, real quick, but again, they all have to be answered with yes. So for example, was the condition survey, the blight study conducted by an independent consultant for the subject properties um, with such survey being commissioned by the at the property owner's expense? Answer of course to that one is a yes in this case. Um, where the property owners inform the condition survey report will need to be scheduled for and presented to city council a public hearing uh, by the property owners and their independent consultant answer is yes because they're all here tonight to to talk about a little bit further uh you know where the property owners inform council's 1427 blight determination would not change any of the tax collection or change the ability to use the power of eminent domain it's only for the purposes of 1427 um, and not an urban renewal property. And so with that, I will say that all 11 of those items were, were uh, identified as yes. And so there, we went through all of that. The uh, consultant's report indicates that there are nine state identified blighting elements that exist on these properties. Um, that is sufficient uh, for a blight designation to be conferred. A minimum of four blighting factors must be present um, for blighting, uh, for this kind of a blight determination, this 1427. Um, uh, Ann Ricker from Ricker Cunningham will be going through all of those those uh, 11 uh, uh, sorts of uh, light conditions um, and talking about them. I'll just mention three of the nine that were present, deteriorated and deteriorating structures, unsanitary or unsafe conditions, um, buildings that are unsafe or unhealthy for people to live or work. Those conditions were on the site as well as six others and, and Ann will talk about that. Again, the study area encompasses two properties, 995 and 999 Sheridan uh, Boulevard in Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, the property currently has a great deal of deferred maintenance and is in need of substantial repair or of redevelopment. Um, it's uh, proposed at this point or thought at this point to do a uh, redevelopment on the site into a mixed use project consistent with the comprehensive plan and consistent with the zoning. Uh, the project uh, is exploring a variety of, uh, of projects uh, potentials or elements um, and the project could bring in additional development added infrastructure potential neighborhood serving amenities and uh, jobs study area is located three blocks from the established west colfax avenue corridor reinvestment area or the urban renewal area um, and this ura border is at the uh, is at 14th avenue um, this property is about three blocks to the south of that boundary uh, the sheridan station on the light rail stop of the w line is under 200 feet from this study area. Um, the property is on the 40 West Art Line, uh, which you know is a community amenity that's well supported. Um, it's, this property is in the Colorado Enterprise Zone, which is a program aimed at uh, promoting a business friendly environment in an economically distressed uh, area. This property is also located within a federal opportunity zone on um, the census block in which this subject property sits uh, was given opportunity zone status because it has seen a disproportionately slow 
economic recovery and growth, and that is from the 2008 recession, not from the uh, uh, not from what the, uh, the the pandemic recession here. Um, these properties are located um, in additional federal zones that include uh, a community development block grant area, uh, low income housing tax credit area, uh, the study area property. Uh, again, found to have uh, nine of 11 uh, white factors, at least four are required. Um, I'll also quickly point out that if the property does receive a 1427 blight designation, it won't change the zoning or grant additional zoning requirements. So with that, I'll uh, mention a couple of other things real quick, but if uh, I could have the city clerk bring up the, uh, the uh, guests this evening, the applicants and the uh, consultants, um, so they can join the meeting here real quick. I'll introduce them in very short order. I, I did review uh, the Lakewood Speaks, and as the mayor said, there are 26 comments uh, as well as two letters of support uh, from the public in favor of the council finding a 1427 blight designation for these properties. Um, the two letters came from the 40 West Arts District and the West Colfax Community Association, better known as the WCCA. As I mentioned, all of these were in favor of finding the blight designation. There were zero comments from the public uh, that were against finding a blight designation um, for these two properties. So with that, uh, I'd uh, like to make the council aware that the applicants are in attendance this evening. Mr. Peter Wall, Mr. Vince Coviello uh, are available to answer questions if uh, uh, I've asked. And then uh, mostly we'll be hearing uh, about the condition survey from uh, the blight consultant, Ms. Ann Ricker. Again, Ann is the principal and managing director of Ricker Cunningham. Um, they're a nationally recognized leading real estate advisory firm uh, based here in Colorado. So after Ann runs through the conditions uh, survey, uh, we're happy to answer any questions the council may have at that point. So with that, I will turn it over to Ann. I will bring up her PowerPoint on the screen and we will go from there. Thanks, Thank you. And welcome, Ann and Vince and Peter. Thank you, Mayor and council members. All right, I believe you should be able to see the presentation at this time. Does everyone see it? Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, Vanessa, thank you. Um, would you mind going to the next slide? In just a second. Okay. Thanks. Um, what I've just provided here um, is just a, an outline of what we're going to cover tonight. Um, I've been asked to move quickly through the presentation. I know you guys have um, seen uh, similar presentations for other properties. So that's my plan. Having said that, if there are any questions at all, you need any clarification, of course, um, I would encourage that um, at the end of the presentation. Next, please. Just in, in terms of um, credentials, um, uh, building on what, what Robert said, um, we've been in business almost 30 years, uh, completed over 165 urban renewal assignments in the last 25, 26 years. Um, we've worked for 51 of the 60 or so urban renewal authorities in the state of Colorado and also in other states, and we're the ongoing financial advisors to 10 authorities. Um, we have numerous technical articles and publications. Um, we issued a statewide report on the impact of urban renewal in Colorado, testified multiple times before the Colorado State Legislature on urban renewal issues. I was a former board member of Downtown Colorado, Inc., Colorado, Inc. which is the um, state's urban renewal advocacy group um, and a regular presenter at statewide conferences on urban renewal matters. So basically urban renewal is kind of in my DNA. Um, so in terms of the survey area, and Robert mentioned this to you, it's located located in the southwest quadrant of 10th Avenue and North Sheridan Boulevard. We refer to it as a property, but within the property there's two parcels and it maintains two multi-tenant uh, commercial structures as well as um, surface parking facilities to support both of them. Next. Um, here we've got a, a summary of some of the um, pertinent facts uh, regarding the properties. Uh, the, the ones that we just wanted to highlight here were the um, mixed-use core transit uh, zoning designation. Um, we'll 
reference that a little bit more in detail in terms of um, that designation relative to what's there today and community objectives for the property that line up much more with the zoning than than the current uses. The total site is about 2.49 acres. Um, the two buildings were constructed over 23 years ago um, well over um, and since then it was interesting to answer some of your questions in the the form uh, that was submitted with the condition survey uh, there was a, a question about uh, why the findings of blight um, why uh, some you know perception of the area beyond just the technical information we provided. And we went back and looked at property values in and around the subject property and found that um, the, pro the subject property itself is really deflated um, in terms of comparing it to the appreciation levels of properties in and around the area. Um, it was a, an average of 2%. We believe that that increase was largely attributed to well, attributable to a general reassessment of property. So it really underperformed um, from a value standpoint relative to other properties in the area. Next. Um, the, the MCT zoning um, that I mentioned earlier, one of the things we always do is, well, we, we are bound by the statutory definition of blight and factors of blight therein. Um, the whole idea of, of a designation of blight and then in some instances an urban renewal uh, plan and moving forward with that is to advance not only cure conditions of blight but also advance the goals and objectives of the community so we always look at the zoning we look at your comprehensive plan area plans corridor plans and things like that we highlighted a few elements here of the zoning for the property. It calls for higher density mixed use development, pedestrian oriented, um, a pedestrian oriented environment, uh, buildings that are located within a short distance um, of public roads or basically with not the surface parking in the front, which is basically what we have there. And in fact, auto oriented design elements, exactly what is in place there are not only discouraged, but restricted um, in these kinds of properties with this kind of zoning. Next. As I mentioned, we also looked at the comprehensive plan, um, um, also um, the uh, station area plan and that, and then to the land use vision map that is, is part of the comprehensive plan. And um, within that document, we noticed that the city has identified the property as part of uh, being located in the southeastern portion of the West Rail West Colfax Corridor Growth Area, one of seven um, in the area and just south of the Sheridan Station on the West Rail Line. Um, next slide, please. We mentioned that because in the Sheridan Station area plan, um, as well as all those documents, you've done a great job as a city to make sure that there's great alignment across your policy and regulating documents and all of them support uh, and align with the definition of the zoning that's applied to the site and completely in contrast, just interestingly, um, to what exists there. Uh, today. Um, also noted in the report is um, the efforts of the West Colfax Community Association and what they're trying to promote along the West Rail Line. And again, this property being within the basic trajectory and influence area of, of the Sheridan Station um, speaks to, again, pedestrian friendly, all the things I mentioned before. So, um, you've aligned your documents, but the use there has not caught up with your vision for the area. Next. So here um, we've, we've got just a, a, an image of the document, the application form that was submitted. Um, and um, therein we restate your purpose um, that was covered by Robert in terms of providing, you know, the goal of this proper or this assignment was really to provide council with the information from which to make a determination as to um, the presence of a sufficient number um, a statutory threshold number of factors that might be present within the area. And you're going to see that tonight. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, we've we've provided you again and again. I know you you all have received many, many presentations. Um, perhaps you've even committed this to, to memory. But um, just to remind everybody, there's 11 
factors of blight, um, A through K5. And um, the way the, the statute reads is that the statutory threshold that must be met for a finding of blight is four um, or five if there's the known intention to use eminent domain. Um, this is obviously a different kind of exercise because you're using this threshold for other purposes. But I mentioned that and then the third threshold, which is one, um, the presence of only one factor, if in fact it is a voluntary request for designation. Entirely up to, to you all city council, um, if you consider that one threshold relevant given um, your purposes for this, but we would say, and we said in the report that while we found the presence of nine of 11 factors, one could argue if you wanted to that um, one was really the threshold that needed to be met just because it's a single property with two parcels and a voluntary request for designation. Next. So um, to give you the, the answer right up front and reiterate what Robert said, um, our findings were that there were nine of the 11 factors. For the record, I'm gonna go ahead and read the actual finding provided um, in our report. So nine of the 11 total possible factors were either identified or observed at varying levels of intensity in the survey area and all at levels considered adverse and impactful to a degree that any resolution or mitigation would be time intensive and costly yet necessary to advance stated community goals and to ensure the, and this is a um, excerpt from the statute, sound growth of the municipality, provision of housing accommodations, economic and social equity, along with public health, safety, morals, and welfare. So that is our opinion as independent, um, analysts to you, of course, city council will make the final decision. Next slide, please. So the way I've got this laid out, and again, I'll move quickly through it, but please, if you have any questions, is um, I've got a slide for every single factor. What we've listed in blue are some of the conditions, the primary conditions that we look for in the context of that factor. If they are bolded, it means that they were either identified or observed at a level that we believed um, sufficient to meet the statutory requirements. Um, I often say here, um, having done this for 33 years, that um, sometimes we'll get asked, well, it seems to me any property could be blighted based on um, you know, a condition survey, that it's a very subjective opinion. And um, I usually pause here and remind everybody that with 33 years of experience, um, as well as the credentials I provided you with uh, previously, we don't believe that it's subjective, we believe it's objective, and that we bring that past experience as well as our testimony and um, our, our uh, our expert testimony, even in, in several cases, um, we bring that with us and use that as um, almost a, a governor on our analyses and evaluations for every area we go to. So um, just wanted to head that off at the pass up front. Um, in terms of factor A, um, we've got some supporting images for each of the factors. Um, the, you know, it's, it's clearly obvious that there is a deterioration of the improvements, both the site improvements and the building improvements. Um, you can see those, the tarp over the roof um, appeared to be uh, some sort of uh, protection for the interior of the buildings. I will tell you, and it stated this in the report as well, that we do all of our observations from public rights of way um, where the public can view things. We do not go inside unless we're invited to do so. In this case, we uh, looked from the public rights of way, any place that was publicly accessible, we did not go inside. Um, so all of the factors, all of the conditions, I mean here, um, were observed or identified in terms of the physical improvements within the property. Next. In terms of um, factor B, uh, defective or inadequate street layout, this um, probably the most pervasive issue that was creating um, serious uh, issues and concerns. And we believe it really played out not just in our visual observation, but in our analysis of traffic accidents and criminal incidents, 
was um, given the, the property's location right at the intersection, uh, the lack of a defined um, access, uh, ingress, egress points, um, and especially being on a busy commercial street and being a commercial use itself, um, we um, observed several conflict stop starts, not just between vehicles, but also between vehicles and pedestrians and, and bicycles and that. So that lack of driveway definition was an issue. And then also within the property, the fact that um, there aren't clearly defined um, parking spaces, obviously that hasn't been updated in years. Um, you know, we saw people walking across the, the parking lot and roads without any sort of guidance, um, potentially, you know, uh, almost hitting them and, and that. So we, we watched it happen in and around the property. And then, as I said, we analyzed the traffic incident history in the area and traffic incidents of all incidents um, in the area as measured, we used as our, our baseline area. I think it was beat, one of the police beats, um, what was it, beat S6. Um, uh, traffic incidents themselves, and that includes those conflicts, um, thefts, things like that, represented 75% um, of all of those um, police documented incidents. The other 25, I will tell you, um, were criminal, but they were of the most severe criminal uh, types of incidents. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of that going on. Um, next terms of faulty lot layout due to size or shape um, we B and C are very much alike typically if you find the presence of conditions supporting factor B uh, it's a fait accompli that factor C comes in but one thing that I did want to highlight for you and this is something we see often in commercial corridors and established communities um, Parcel, one of the parcels, the larger parcel um, that holds the building um, that faces uh, Sheridan Boulevard, it's clearly of an adequate size. Um, the parking requirements in terms of those parking spaces that are accessible to the building immediately in front of it and not in the parking lot um, were reasonable, not quite compliant with your zoning, but close enough. The other building, however, really the size of that site is far less than half an acre. The parking was not compliant. And were that was that building not to be held by the same ownership, which is possible, it would be completely non-compliant because it wouldn't be big enough to support the required parking. So it necessitates a single ownership and therefore that portion of the property is um, not compliant at all and, and um, a big flag uh, as far as factor C is concerned. Uh, next, please. Factor D, unsanitary and unsafe conditions really cover all the things we talked about in terms of the roadway um, and, and for both vehicular and non-vehicular movement. But we also look at some other areas. We look at the potential presence of environmental contamination in the property. We look at drainage. Um, we look at whether the property's in a floodplain. And then from an unsanitary uh, standpoint, um, you know, we're looking for uh, the presence of uh, vandalism or graffiti, um, all of those things were basically identified in terms of unsanitary. Um, I've already addressed the roadway issues. The property is not within a floodplain. We did see some drainage issues um, and concerns that would likely have to be taken care of. Uh, Hazardous contaminants, we really will address under J. I can tell you that while the property itself did not necessarily show up on the EPA records that we looked at, and that's all I can say. They're, they might be there, but nothing was provided um, or obvious. The property is completely surrounded by seven um, environmental sites, in, including one uh, brownfield site. So we'll talk about that and how we address that. Um, next, please. Factor E, deterioration of site or other improvements. Um, this is where you really start to look at things like the fencing, the secondary structures, obviously the signage, um, parking surface, um, all of those things were present. Um, and also um, the property itself was not compliant with the city's landscaping requirements. Um, signage, um, all of those things. So they were non-compliant with all of these and all of these things were um, observed and identified. 
Next, please. F, uh, unusual top topography or inadequate public improvements. Um, so the site is flat, so that was not an issue. In terms of inadequate public improvements, not, um, not all of the information we requested was available from the various utilities. Some concern was expressed by staff regarding um, energy levels, um, but um, again, you know, I, I can only say that those, other than that, they couldn't be confirmed or denied. What was present and identified was uh, a lack of street lighting sufficient to provide for um, safe and appropriate pedestrian non-vehicular movement. Um, the presence of overhead utilities, while properties are grandfathered in basically by city codes in that, it's not required to, to lower them. In terms of the urban renewal statute, um, the presence of overhead utilities is widely considered a blighting factor because of the visual impact. And it's also been known to have uh, essentially a depressing impact on property values. So we do identify it here again. Um, it's up to council to consider all of these factors um, in the context or all of these conditions in the context of this factor. Uh, next, G. Um, we did not count G. This was one of the ones that fell off. Um, we did identify, let me say, um, uh, the presence of a 14-foot easement uh, along the roadway, and it was associated with the sidewalk, but we did not include it because um, a more in-depth review of other properties in the area showed that all of them suffer along the roadway suffered from the same sort of impact so we didn't feel that that was a disproportionate adverse impact to this property so while there is the presence of an easement which is something that we would consider in the context of this factor we just took the more conservative uh, route and did not uh, count that here next H, um, again, I've, I've talked about and I alluded to earlier, the high traffic incidents, the high crime rates, that they were among the more um, severe uh, criminal incidents. So we have continued to see while we saw some up and down um, in terms of criminal incidents, um, it's been at a sustained level that would, um, and, and in our experience has been considered uh, disproportionately high, meaning that the city is having to spend a disproportionate amount of its resources on this property um, in this area to address these issues. And that's why it qualifies here. Um, one thing that we investigated was the presence of sprinklers. Um, we highly suspect that they are not there, but again, I can tell you that we did not receive um, that information back before the report was completed. So um, I highlighted here, but, and again, we suspect it, but we can't confirm it. No floodplain. Yes, there were high crime rates. And again, I mentioned that there's hazardous contaminants, contaminants um, in multiple locations around the property. Next, please. I, uh, buildings and properties that are unsafe and unhealthy. Again, this is really a mirror of factor A, which deals with are these buildings unsafe for people to live, work, or uh, live or work in, or properties that are unsafe for people to pass through. So if you have A, you typically have I for all the same reasons. Next, please. Okay, Jay, um, these were the uh, properties that were identified in our EPA search. And as I mentioned, um, all of them came up as EPA monitored sites. Um, we did not find documentation that any had been um, addressed, resolved, put to bed. Um, but again, we chose to take the more conservative route here because there wasn't specifically proper or contamination attached to the property itself. Um, we didn't necessarily feel like um, that, you know, it, it, we didn't want to reach in any way. Um, and so I will tell you that were we to have been provided with plume maps and things like that, I, you know, again, we highly suspect that 
even though these um, contaminant contaminated sites and, and the presence of adverse conditions associated with environmental contamination are likely impacting surrounding properties, we could not confirm that based on the information available. So we mentioned them here, but we did not count them. So this was the second factor we did not include. Next, please. And then the last one is factor K-5, uh, high service requirements or substantial underutilization. And I mentioned the high service requirements, disproportionate amount of city services um, that are having to service this property that are then therefore obviously not available for your other efforts. I mentioned the crime rates, um, but also the site and building improvement ratio, the, the use or underutilization of the property. So not only is the property under utilize simply from the standpoint of the amount of building area that you have to land area, but more importantly, um, the vacancy within the buildings. Our estimate is that both buildings combined are at about a 70% vacancy rate. Um, we wanted to know how that compared um, to the market. The, the submarket that this area is in was the second lowest as of uh, the first quarter of 2021 in the entire Denver metro area, I think it was a 6.7% vacancy rate. So you can see um, that at 70%, if it wasn't obvious already, um, it's significantly uh, vacant and underutilized, um, but definitely so uh, compared to the average for the market and submarket that it's in. And then next please. So uh, again, in summary, our support or what we find as conditions that we think support a finding of blight um, and specifically as it relates to um, the Lakewood resolution and, and your purpose for requiring this investigation is that there's an upward trend in traffic accidents and supporting roadways upper trend in criminal incidents, there's the presence of unsafe and unsanitary conditions, the presence, presence of environmental contaminants in the area, not necessarily within the property, but we believe that there is a, a significant possibility that uh, just in the area could still create a costly improvement for um, the property owner uh, were the property to be redeveloped. So uh, next slide one more supporting statement i mentioned too and this is really in speaking to the criteria that you all lay out in the form is uh just the depressed nature of the value increase or lack of increase of this property again compared to other properties in the area the other ones are surpassing it uh, investment is passing it by um, and we mentioned this because when those conditions exist and as a real estate economist i can tell you that there truly is a multiplicative effect of adversity that that tends to migrate to other properties um, and and really uh does uh, dissolve or diminish the efforts of other property uh, property improvements and investments that are made. So um, it, it's an important consideration, not just within this property itself, but what its potential impact is having on surrounding properties. Uh, next, we're almost finished. Oh, we are finished. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. That was uh, very thorough. And, and while we have been through a few of these, that was probably the most expansive presentation that, that I think I've seen. Uh, Council, I want to start with questions and certainly then we'll go to a motion. And then again, we do have a potential amendment. With your questions, if you could please refer to the page in the report that you're looking at, that'll also help all of us uh, follow along as well as uh, the representatives tonight who are joining us. So I'm going to go Ward 2. Do you have any questions first? Okay. We'll go ahead and go to Councillor Johnson. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, at one point you mentioned energy issues or concerns. Could you please define more what you meant by that? I sure can. Um, I, I want to read it directly from the report, make sure I have it right. Um, so I will tell you that, you know, there's, I'm sure you're very aware, there's a number of 
utility companies that service different areas of Lakewood, right, for various um, different kinds of infrastructure and utilities. And um, what we were able to glean um, from our conversations was, let's see, um, no information was provided regarding the condition or capacity of the utility infrastructure. And we look at that from the standpoint of not so much what's on the site today, but what could be on the site based on city zoning, perhaps what's being proposed. So we weren't able to say if there's an increase in these, would there be a deficient, any deficiencies in water or wastewater or you know power or things like that. And what we were able to get back was that city staff has mentioned previous concerns regarding energy levels that either may or may not have been resolved with new development in the area, but basically nonetheless um, should be the property owner or future property owner should be made aware of. Thank you. And just one other question. Is there any idea what is going to be built on this property? So Robert, I, um, I, I, try and keep the most objective view completely uh, devoted to the blight study itself. Um, I am aware that uh, there's a proposal for residential and I was aware that that whatever the final program was that uh, from my kind of checking a box it lined up much more with the community's objectives and vision for the area than what was there. Beyond that though I, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I'm happy to. I believe that they're considering mixed use, but there's not a formulated uh, you know, proposal yet at this point. Is there any density type of issue that's been mentioned, number? Not to the best of my knowledge, no. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Springsteen. Hi there, thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you. I've been trying to sort of determine what makes me uncomfortable with regard to blight designation. And please understand that I've driven past this site probably thousands of times in my life because I grew up just a few blocks from it. And there's some part of it that feels discriminatory in nature to me because this is a neighborhood of people of color and um, the purpose of all of this is to gentrify this neighborhood and what has already occurred is that people of color have been driven out of this neighborhood in every way shape and form and there is a great deal of high density right on this corner by the RTD parking lot, which concerns me regarding traffic. And so you're making statements about problems with traffic in the area. This is, this is um, these are normal intersections, high, high volume intersections, uh, Sheridan Boulevard and 10th Avenue, high volume intersections. There is absolutely, if there's anything wrong with those intersections, the city of Lakewood and the city of Denver should do something about that because these are simply, you know, city streets. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, um, a concern I would have with the density would be how are those city streets going to handle more density in that area when you have literally just multiple, multiple uh, units that went up there recently. Mm. But um, <clears throat> I guess, so what you narrowed it down to four main things, traffic, criminal, traffic, no, uh, roadway. Uh, criminal, no. unsafe and unsanitary, and contaminants. Three of those things have nothing to do with that particular property. 
they have to do with the area around that property. So what does that have to do with a blight of a particular property? But um, beyond that, um, you know, and I have asked this and been cut off at the pass every time, but I think it's a, a reasonable question. You do blight studies. How many have you done? What do you get paid for them? And when do you ever find that a property is not blighted? What percentage do you find since you're being paid by the developer? Now, you know, I mean, I used to sit in this parking lot with my mom when she ran into the grocery store that was there. Uh -huh. And um, so I know exactly what's been going on on this property for like 40 years. Um, but I, I guess I, I would just like to know what's the difference between being blighted and being just, you know, run down because the city allowed it to be, mm. and it yeah. can't be, it can't be refurbished in yeah. some way. Yeah. And why do we have to consider it blighted rather than allow it to just fall within uh, normal development uh, standards. And then finally, what I asked the last expert was to define some of these terms that you're using, mm -hmm. like slum. Mm -hmm. What is a slum to you? Because for me, when you call the neighborhood I grew up in a slum, yeah, I find that to be discriminatory. So tell me what a slum is. Okay. So there was a whole thing I'm going to unpack there. So I'm not, I'm not going to start in any specific order. So my definition of slum doesn't matter. Um, I have to follow the urban renewal statute. It's a statutory definition, just like blight is. And it is defined as I presented, um, the presence of those adverse conditions that I showed you, um, here, I've got it here. Um, when there's a deterioration of the building, uh, roof walls, fascia, windows, doors, stairways, foundation, mechanical equipment, fences, gates, and secondary structures. So again, thank goodness, I don't have to define slum. I have to follow the rules. So that is the statutory definition. I, I can say personally that I get why that's an offensive term. I think blight's an offensive term. Um, and I and I try and remind people that that too is a legal term that I have to reference because I have to follow the statute. Um, when you said, why does it have to be considered blighted? Um, my response to that would be that you, the city council and the city of Lakewood have chosen to use that statute as your barometer or your measure of whether a property can be exempt from the growth. So I didn't choose it. Um, it was chosen for us. Not to say I don't think it's appropriate. It really doesn't matter what I think. But um, the designation of blight or the finding of blight was your city's measure. So again, I, I have no say in that. Um, you ask a really excellent question about what are those factors that a city itself should fix and, and how that then gets folded up. And I think it's a great question. And my answer to you is, yeah, there's a lot of blighting factors that happen around a property, a private property um, that are in the purview of the public sector. Totally agree with you. When we look at them though, in the context of a blight study though, what we're looking at them from the perspective we're saying if i was this property owner right if i owned this retail store that thing that's happening out in the street um whether it's pedestrians coming to my store that are being hit or they can't walk at night because of the lights yes those are those are things that will require some sort of public uh, maybe public private intervention and cost but they're affecting me and my business and my properties so it's not really an assignment of blame. It's saying, what is the adverse impact of conditions? 
whether it's Excel or whether it's the city or whether it's the EPA or something, uh, and, and that included the conditions around it, that are adversely impacting that private property and business owner. So that's the perspective we take. Um, you asked can, how can many- I, Can I just break in there? But what you are saying there then is that is that essentially the public entities around it are creating the blight and treating the property in a discriminatory way by not providing the things it needs to run its business or to be safe or whatever it is. So um, how, how does that have to do with the property itself? So I don't, I, I, I think I agreed with you uh, part of what you said, and then I think you made a connection that I wouldn't necessarily make. Um, I think what where you said that those are public uh, public improvements, conditions, right? Um, con- infrastructure that is having an impact on private property owners. Absolutely agree. Um, what I would say when you got to discrimination in that, I I don't see it that way. The way I see it. Uh, doing what I do and as a community strategist is that I'm a mom, right? I have six kids. Um, I have I have X resources. I have to decide how to allocate my resources across my entire family. City council people have resources. They have a city. They have neighborhoods. They have roads. It's the budgetary process. It's how do you decide to allocate your resources across across what's broken, what's not broken, what needs to be improved, how do you balance your portfolio? These are difficult decisions you make. So I don't see deteriorating roads as a direct assault or an intentional assault against property owners, but that doesn't diminish the fact that until those resources are available to address those concerns, that they don't have an adverse impact on property owners and, and thus, in, in the traditional sense, communities then consider urban renewal designations or other incentives that can provide those resources that don't then have to further diminish a limited, you know, general fund. Um, so that's kind of the natural progression that you usually make for these things. So again, can't I can't emphasize or not, I don't see it as a direct assault. I think it's an unfortunate circumstance. And the idea here is that how can you take the community vision for the area and say, what's holding that up? And this is one of those things is these adverse conditions that are so costly that will make property owners go somewhere else and will continue to disproportionately cost the city and diminish their efforts. So you say, is it worth it? Is it not? Maybe the private property owner picks up some of this expense and, and kind of lightens the load of the city. So. That, that's what I would say on that. You mentioned the three factors that I said, you know, really distilled down. I, I would like to highlight there, really they were the nine factors. The ones that I highlighted actually were in direct response to the question that was posed on the form. So it addressed specific things that your form had asked for. That does not take away from the other six things that we said were present. So. And only one of the three that you mentioned was around the area. And again, that was so we took a very conservative approach. The last thing you wanted to know how many condition surveys that I've done. So of 165 assignments, I think I'm upwards of 75 condition surveys in Colorado and other states, but the vast majority in Colorado. I, I From a percentage standpoint, I'm willing to say that um, probably definitely found sites that I said, I, there just isn't, you know, I just, I don't see it. Um, I can write you a report, but I don't see it. Um, but less than 10%. And, and I, I attribute that to the fact that, um, you had mentioned that the developers pay for it. This is the first of 165 assignments that the developer has paid for. And it's because of the system you set up all of our work, we insist that the Urban Renewal Authority pay our fees. Now, if you want to have the developer pay you, and then you pay us, but our belief is that if I'm going to give you an independent analysis for the very reason you asked, 
I can't have my paycheck have the developer's name on it. In this instance, you're set up this way, but that has no bearing at all because I would have no credibility. I would no longer be able to testify before the legislature. I would not be an expert witness anymore. So it does not serve me to do anything but be completely independent in my analysis. They paid me $5,000 actually because I was able to move quickly on this and because I'd done work in the area and I, I was familiar with it. Um, and I think that answered all your questions. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Bita and then Councillors Vincent and LaBeer. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just have a couple questions. Um, first of all, would you agree that this property as it sits right now, even with the, the problems that you've identified, uh, could in fact be developed or redeveloped? Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Could they, could it be developed with the conditions that are, are present there? Well, with the problems that you've identified. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, what I can tell you and make tell me if I answer your question, um, they would all have to be addressed and quick estimate uh, as an advisor on these things. Um, I would guess that the cost to mitigate the adverse conditions on top of just pure development costs, you know, so demolition and things like that um, could easily be an additional 20%. That can start to make a project infeasible. Um, so I, I don't know anything about um, what they've approached you about in terms of assistance, if they have, or density, you know, because there's there's different ways to make up that gap. And if there's a desire by the community, you've mentioned density a couple times to th keep things lower, well, then you start to squeeze the feasibility formula a little bit, but that is at your all's discretion about how to get a project uh, through the finish line one that is lines up with your community, your vision, but it, it would be difficult and costly. Okay. And if you get a blight designation, you still have to deal with those same issues. Oh yeah. The costs are going to be the same. Oh yeah. And, and then some, yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I would ask you then with that in mind, what can you do with a blight designation that you can't do now that you can't already do? Yeah. So for in, in this context, uh, they can't do anything without a blight designation um, because of what they're proposing on the site. And what they're proposing on the site is what you all have said you want because of what the zoning is and every other policy document that covers this property. You've said you want mixed use. You want it to make sense in terms of its proximity to transit. Um, you can't do that um, without being this property meeting your exception rule, therefore it has to be blighted. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just connecting your dots. Um, so that's that's okay. kind of it. it so, they require each other. Okay, so you're saying that um, it's, it's because of the exceptions, that's what you need the blight designation for, because of the exceptions to SGI. It, in, in, right? in this context, because of the way the city has laid out the rules for growth and development. Um, absolutely. And then I, you know, the, the end part of it is that, okay, obviously your city council, you're, you're the people, you know, you're the deciders in that, but your guides, your, your resources are the documents that have been adopted by previous city councils that your citizens and your business owners and property owners have all worked on. And all of your documents line up to have a very, very clear vision of this property that is very different than what's there today. Okay, and can you tell me what specific uh, portions of the exemptions that you need here in order to develop this property as you, have you, as you suggested? Um, so let me see. I want to make sure I answer that correctly. Um, the form, hang on, got the form here. Do I? Just one second. I know I do. I don't know. Um, Robert, do you guys ever pull up the completed form on the, on the site or is it addressed in your staff report? 
I'm sorry, I need a repeat of what they exactly were trying to, to repeat. I don't know that it's in the, the form, but if someone would repeat exactly what we're looking for. Well, I can take a crack at it, but basically what was asked was, um, I'm, I'm thinking that the council member is asking, um, please, you know, the question in your form, page four or five, please describe why you believe the property meets the requirements to be designated a blight property pursuant to LMC 14.27 and exempted from the city's allocation process. Please note if you have, you know, additional pages and, and council member, is it beta? Yes. Is, is, is that what you wanted to make sure I addressed? Well, not exactly. What oh, I asked okay. you, not exactly. What I asked you was, um, you had said that there were, uh, the reason you needed the designation was so you could take advantage of the exemptions. And my question to you is, what particular exemptions are you talking about? Oh, 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 okay. So first I have to clarify, it's not me because I don't own the property um, and I'm not oh, interested in it. I meant so, your, your client. Cur, cur, well, the person who paid for the study, um, correct. Um, and so the exemption, as um, we stated on the in the PowerPoint, was the one that reads, um, the city must cap its growth at 1% annually with an exemption exception for new housing units either located in established urban renewal areas or within properties that maintain adverse conditions at a threshold that would otherwise make them eligible for an urban renewal designation. So that is your definition um, from chapter 14.27 of the Lakewood Municipal Code. That is the, I won't say exemption, it's the exception um, that, that they are requesting and they need that finding of blight as per your city code. So how does the 1% limitation affect you at all? What difference uh, does it make not, to you? Let me, let me finish. What difference does it make to you or your client whether this uh, accounts towards the 1% exemption? That's what I don't understand. I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person to answer that. Hi, uh, my name is Vince Coviello. <clears throat> I'm the owner in Infinium Properties. Uh, and, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And, uh, Anne, thank you for uh, answering the questions so far. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, uh, just to kind of address your question, you know, we're, uh, my job as a, a developer is uh, pretty simple. It's to come in and uh, address uh, the the issue at hand and try to de develop a property to its highest and best use. And that really means um, looking at you know all the factors involved and trying to uh, maximize that property. Um, and that makes the positive in a way that makes a positive impact in the neighborhood. We've worked extremely hard uh, over the years to do just that. And, and you know, when I come in and, and look at a property, I'm, I'm looking at all uh, addressing all of the needs and looking at, you know, what what's the state, all the stakeholders in this uh, situation, uh, not just investors and developers, but what does the neighborhood need? Because you really can't have a successful project without addressing uh the the neighborhood that you're that you're in so you know the project that we envision is is you know we want it to be truly mixed use uh primarily residential but uh with a active uh, ground floor retail component uh that that truly promotes that kind of walkable uh neighborhood that i think is needed in the area um, we want it to be, again, neighborhood-focused retail, um, and we want it to be an attractive addition. Uh, that corner um, is something, you know, I've lived in Denver area for over 20 years. I've, like everybody else, I've driven by that corner a lot. Um, I live, you know, five minutes away, and uh, it's something that I've always thought, uh, you know, we, we could really do a good job at uh, trying to address it. But... Uh, you know, in answer to your question, um, as a developer, 
it really needs to make sec make sense economically and to uh, not have the blight uh, exemption really makes it unfeasible for us to come in um, and do anything with the property on uh, the kind of uh, kind of scale that 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 corner demands uh, that uh, that site is such an important gateway site for the community uh, and I think can really have a positive impact if if we let it <laughs> but uh, if we don't have that exemption um, it just makes it, it makes developing the site so difficult uh, and so time consuming that it just makes it economically not feasible. Okay, so as a follow up, if I may, um, you indicated that you would like to do some sort of a mixed use development. Yes. Is that, is that right? And as I, my understanding is that that is currently zoned for mixed use. Yes. Is that correct? So yes. the zoning doesn't prohibit you from doing that. No. And, um, but you're saying that, uh, if I understood you, that the economically it wouldn't be feasible if you uh, don't have uh, a, a, uh, an exemption from SGI. And so I guess my, that raises the question is, well, what is it about SGI that makes it unfeasible? I mean, you've got the zoning, you already got what you want. I mean, what you're looking for, so you've got that. Uh, yeah, my, SGI, my does, SGI doesn't change the zoning. The zoning remains the same. So how is it economically unfeasible um, under SGI? My understanding of the ordinance means that I need to, uh, if it's over 40 units of residential, uh, basically get in line. Um, and that line will take a, an extremely long time to get through to get the permits. And so uh, from that standpoint, it, it makes a, a project that would take you know, a normal amount of time, which is still a long time, uh, it turns it into something that is economically unfeasible because it's it turns it into a project that is just uh, I don't I don't know when when I couldn't even put a timeline. I'm not sure anybody could put a timeline on when the property could actually be developed. Okay, and does the the uh, specific provision uh, limiting the number of units to one percent? per year, does that make any difference to you at all? I mean, do you care whether you're the number of units you ultimately decide to build count towards the 1% or not? Does that make any difference to you? It's, it's not my, you know, it's not my job to, uh, you know, get involved in, in uh, what I think would be a city, a city council decision on, you know, whether this, uh, whether that affects the number of units. And um, I'm, I'm solely concerned with uh with this property. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. That's all I have. You're welcome. I'm gonna to go to Councilors LeBeer and Vincent or Vincent and LeBeer. I think that certainly yeah. been for some time and this is your your word, so please. Exactly. Um, first, I'd like to, to, if I could, this is gonna kind of take in some of the questions that may have been asked um, as someone who still lives in the neighborhood and I can understand, and I. I go past it every day. I deal with the people who live there. Um, and I too used to, as a point of fact, take my kids into Nodders, which was before this. So Nodders was half a bar and on the other half was a wonderful uh, family owned Chinese place where we went into probably with the kids once a month or so. And these things started deteriorating and um, People would not go in there anymore. And then I know there's been some questions that have been asked about why isn't this developed? Well, until this blight designation came through and I could not talk about this anymore, there were people, in fact, you can still see a white building um, that had a little bit of pavement done on it that was going to open as kind of a nightclub. They could not open because I happen to know there were no sprinklers in there. When they asked the owner to build sprinklers in there, he refused. So they put quite a bit of money in there. Um, the rest of the businesses have gone. It is a high crime area. And we talk, sometimes we throw out the word gentrification, but I've got to say 
that what I prefer to use in this area is the health of the neighborhood. As you know, Caddy Corner, we got somebody, in fact, Mr. Alonowitz, who spoke here, um, took a giant step to develop some of those townhomes, which are attainable housing, and a lot of younger people have moved in there. But I need to point out that within a six-block area, we have five affordable housing units, and we have one low-income housing unit. We have the Head Start, and there's also across the street very, very good possibility that there's going to be tiny homes to get homeless off the street, which will be right in that area. So rather than send, set gentrification, which is going to be one small area, I think has been pointed out before that we have, we have a cross section of things there. And we finally just got an updated park, which people from Denver and that area come over to as far as the splash park. Um, so I know that businesses have gone there, have tried to come in there. This has been going on for, for at least 12 years. And maybe uh, Councilor LeBure has a different take on it, but it's probably the number one thing I get asked about when will you do when will you do something about 10th and Sheridan as if I had that much power so <laughs> this has been worked on for a long long time and people are so thrilled and the first thing they want to see if this gets passed is to have that thing leveled to get rid of the contaminants if you've ever driven over there i drove in there just recently went to the back because somebody said it gotten worse i almost lost the right tire in the place so there's a lot of things going on over there but i have a hard time saying it's just related to gentrification or certain people or i don't think we would have five affordable housing places right around the light, light rail. So that's all. I wanted to add maybe some context and some things. Mr. LeBeer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilor Vincent. I think I would do the same thing and just say that, you know, to me, this is, this is a very important, huge investment in uh, not only a parcel or not only a property uh, in a community. Um, you know, I think we all know why we have to have, these type of exemptions, um, because without them, people can't get the financing to build these things without some sort of certainty. Uh, as you know, the developer spoke uh, on these truncated timelines, it's a difficult process and it becomes a political process uh, to try to uh, work these things out without um, the ability to be able to develop in these blighted areas. These exemptions are about encouraging investment. And these are areas that really need uh, encouraging of investment. We've had tons of studies. We've had more studies, I think, in this area than I think anywhere in the city of Lakewood. We've had the Urban Land Institute did a study uh, on Sheridan. We had the Lakewood 20-minute walk plan. Uh, we've had a Jefferson County food desert study about how there's a food desert in the area. We've had the Sheridan Station area plan. We've had the Two Creeks neighborhood uh, plan. <laughs> Denver's got their own plan for the same section just across the street. Uh, I think this is the most planned out area that's had little action in the history of Colorado. It's probably uh, would be my guess. Um, so to me, this is about creating opportunity, uh, housing, commerce, supporting a vibrant neighborhood. There is no area in Lakewood that I would be more supportive of a blight designation uh, and beyond that, not just a blight designation, but taking a look at expanding the urban renewal so we can look at getting some investment dollars and infrastructure all up and down Sheridan. Frankly, this area taught me the uh, inadequate property maintenance codes that we have in the city. We always talk about how we need to uh, you know, keep a better handle on some of these uh, parcels. Well, we're going to have to do more of property maintenance codes, in my view, uh, if we want to actually do that and not just talk about it. Um, this area has had more community complaints. Uh, I think Council Vincent said this, but this area has had more community complaints uh, than I've heard from anywhere else uh, the entire time I've been on council. I've, the only thing I've heard more complaints about were probably uh, cigarette taxes and fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
This area has elicited numerous conversations between Councilor Vince and I and the city manager, the chief of police about the crime, the graffiti, the code violations, uh, building code issues, signage, and frankly, the community deserves better. I don't think we should resign ourselves to say, hey, this this community uh, you know, deserves to have underutilized property that they don't use and they get to see uh, you know, blight uh, every day. I, you know, I drive this literally every single day. So uh, I've probably driven on this 4,000 times since, <laughs> since I've lived here. Um, so anyway, I, I just want to say I'm supportive of this. Uh, the community is supportive of this. Uh, there's been ample community conversation about this. All you have to do is go look on next door. And uh, I can imagine what the response would be if we turned it down. Um, and this is about, to me, uh, reducing regulatory barriers that will impede progress in this part of the area. And we have tons of affordable housing, diverse uh, housing, entry-level housing. We have uh, just down the street, we got um, single-family homes uh, at all different price points. We have townhomes. We have a new apartment coming in. We have affordable housing right next to RTD, very diverse, uh, eclectic community where anybody can live. And this parcel gets us probably one thing that we don't have, which is uh, commercial uh, businesses. So all these people who live in this community can actually have a place that's nice to go to to shop. And uh, and I hope uh, you'll all support it. I ask for your support. Thanks. Councilor Abel. Thank you. Uh, I won't uh, pursue Mr. LeBure's uh, statement that we have tons of affordable housing. It's uh, my impression that we have very little affordable housing in this city. Uh, I do think the, uh, the Mr. Smith's statement, uh, citing deferred maintenance was quite an understatement. It is uh, abandoned maintenance in many places. Um, this, this particular area, uh, these lots have, their reputation precedes them. Uh, the crime rate uh, statistics came as no surprise to me. So that, that lessens the sting, even if it was gentrification, uh, it is a dangerous spot as it exists. So that has to change. Um, I am concerned that we think every time uh, we have something in a rut that is uh, that could qualify for blight, that we do it to uh, avoid the allocation process. We have allocations left over from last year, a ton of. So I would uh, urge the developer to. Uh, check the inventory of allocations before saying this couldn't be done without an exemption. And it does only, I believe, exempt uh, the site from allocations and not from the 1%. Uh, hopefully we will pass Mr. Beta's amendment to clarify that. But uh, if any place in this city needs to be redeveloped, it is the, these lots and uh, so I uh, despite all of the other uh, concerns and the availability of allocations uh, apparently the abundance of allocations of last year's uh, leftovers or uh, any indication uh, but you know I have to say this this property is blighted and it needs some kind of uh, hand up in order to uh, keep it from becoming worse. However, I do think we have a nuisance uh, structures ordinance that might have uh, might have allowed us to uh, take some enforcement action um, before it got to this point. But we are at this point, so I see little uh, little choice. Thank you. Councilor Gutwein. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief because I think that 
uh, it's all been said and probably better than I could say it. Um, but I think this is is about as clear cut as you can get. Um, this is this is a clearly blighted property. Um, I'm very excited about the uh, potential investment in our community and just the difference that it's going to make, the very real difference it's going to make in that, that area. Um, one thing I do want to address is um, I do think that gentrification is, is a really important issue that we should be talking about. Um, and I think that, you know, from what I understand, the best ways to deal with gentrification, um, there, there's a lot of different things. One of them is including affordable housing, which was mentioned by Councillor LeBeer that there is, and Councillor um, Vincent, that there is affordable housing in this area. Um, and we should continue to, you know, hopefully uh, encourage those opportunities. Um, inclusionary zoning, of course, something that we've been talking about for a long time, that would be really exciting if we could do that. Um, but it's also about having a mix of housing rates, um, income levels, market rate housing. Um, so I think that we should be having that conversation. Um, we, can, we should see how we can continue to improve there. But I actually think that this can really be a part of the solution from what I understand about um, housing and the shortage of housing uh, in the city of Lakewood. Um, I will have more to say when we get to anything about uh, process, but I just want to reiterate, I think it's really important that we keep process changes to the um, upcoming workshop and not um, try to tie a, a project in front of us to process changes. Thank you. Great. So, Councillor Bita, a question, and then I'd like to get a motion on the floor so we can address uh, the next steps and potential amendments. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to ask, is this the time for the motion? Are you in the discussion yet? Because it seems like we're in discussions. But Yeah, I let, I let it get off the rail a little bit. My apologies. Okay. That's all right. Okay. I'll no. wait. Thank no, you. that's cool. No, we're going to go to it right now. So, Mayor Pro Tem, if you would, please make a motion. We'll get the motion on the floor. I move the adoption of resolution 2021-35. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Councilor Bita, now do you want to address your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to say that um, I don't really have a problem with the, with this property. If, if what uh, being designated, if what this the developer feels that he needs to uh, encourage the the uh, investment to make it easier to do the investment, and I, I can see that. What I what I don't see, and 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 I asked this question, and I nobody could give me uh, an answer on it, is why uh, it it whatever is ultimately done here cannot count towards the one percent growth lim limit, and I, I have not heard an answer yet. I raised this um, approximately a month ago. I did not get an answer. And I don't think there is an answer. I can't see an answer. There's no reason why this can't be counted towards the 1%, notwithstanding the exemption for the process part. And that's really what I think the, uh, the applicant is asking for is an exemption from the process. The, the ordinance that was passed by the people does not exempt anything from the one percent limit that is i believe sacrosanct in that uh strategic growth initiative that's what it was all about the one percent limit and i see no reason that we should be sacrificing that limitation which was passed by the majority of people in the city of lakewood why we should be sacrificing that for this project or any other project i don't think we should i don't think we have to so accordingly, I'm going to make this motion. I'm going to ask that we uh, <clears throat> consider this motion, which will allow us to have both, have both the exemptions, allow the developer to move forward under a uh, blight designation and still count whatever they ultimately uh, decide to build there, count that towards the 1%. So my uh, motion would be to amend the resolution 2021-35 as follows. 
uh, in the recitals portion, which is the first portion of the uh, uh, um, of the resolution, I would add a sentence that says, whereas chapter 14-27 provides for no exemption to the 1% per year growth limitations provided therein, and whereas a designation of, quote, blighted, unquote, for purposes of chapter 14-27, does not exempt this property from the 1% growth limits of said chapter 14.27. Then going down to the, uh, to the uh, organic portion of the, of the uh, resolution. Now, therefore, add a section four, quote, the number of units ultimately permitted for this property shall be deducted from the total number of un units permitted for that calendar year in which the project makes building permit application as set forth in chapter 14.27.050 semicolon provided however that the project shall not be required to apply for allocations pursuant to chapter 14.27.090 so uh, end quote so that's my that's my uh, that's the language to my resolution and that's my motion Thank you. Second. I second it. Okay, just hold on real quick. The attorney has his hand up. Um, just to make sure, I think there was a clarifying question on it. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I hate I hate to do this. I, I really do, but I don't think this um, amendment to the motion is appropriate. Um, the resolution was noticed as a blight designation um, and what this amendment would do it was it would turn it into a change in the allocations available for the rest of the year um, so absent notice to the public that that's what we're going to do is change the remaining allocations available for the rest of the year um, I, I I think it unfortunately I think it's out of order um, that's that's probably the biggest concern I have with it. Uh, another issue I would mention is that the ordinance itself says that the council will determine the number of allocations available in January. And arguably, um, this would uh, increase the number of allocations av available. And I, and I know, I know Mr. Abel is going to disagree with me. Uh, but that's in effect what it's doing. And the other issue about notice, uh, I would say is that this amendment isn't actually necessary right now. If this is something that council wants to do, council can do this at a, at a later time. You know, there's there's still time to do it. So it's that sort of cuts against the idea that you know we could do this now without without what is arguably proper notice. So I I would uh, I would encourage. Um, and I, I, I apologize, Mr. Bita, uh, I hate to do this to you, but I would encourage you that you um, rescind your motion and, and, and seriously consider doing this through uh, a process like a little later because council can reduce the number of allocations later if council desires to do that. Um, I would encourage that to be done by ordinance, uh, making those change by ordinance as opposed to resolution. Uh, but at this point, um, I just don't think I don't think this is an appropriate motion or an appropriate addition to a blight designation motion. Thank you, Mr. Graham. I'm going to go back to the motion maker, Councillor Bita. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, and then I was going to just mention we are scheduling the workshop as we did address this in the last the last blight designation. I think last regular meeting, we are scheduling. Um, and that was an announcement that I, I still need to get council to weigh in on what they want to see. I know this is one of those, but I don't think we've heard about anything else. But the floor is yours, Councilor Beto. Well, one, I've heard about some workshop, but that's all I've heard is that it's possibly going to take place at some time in the future. So uh, in the meantime, we keep getting these blight, these requests for blight designations, and we keep uh, um, sacrificing the terms of, of, of the, uh, the, ordin the ordinance, which this is just a resolution, but the ordinance, which was passed by the people of this, of this city, we keep sacrificing the terms of that 
in order to placate these resolutions. I, I'm sorry, uh, um, Councillor I, I, uh, Council Graham, I, I disagree with you. This certainly is in the purview of what has been noticed to the public today is the resolution that's been written here. And uh, this is certainly in the purview of, 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 of the issues that are uh, pertinent to this, one of which is how it applies to the strategic growth initiative. So it certainly is is uh, is uh, within the purview. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do have to disagree with you that there is a proper notice here. The whole the, the notice has been given as to what we're going to be doing here and uh, certainly motions to amend what I would consider fairly minor language to amend the resolution are certainly uh, in order at this time. So I would have to disagree with you. Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Bita, I understand what you're saying, but from my perspective, this resolution is solely about whether or not this property is blighted. Um, that's what this resolution is about. That what was what was noticed. Um, changing allocations, um, you know, further limiting allocations for the rest of the year. Um, that's there is no notice. There was no notice about that potential, right? And you, you know, you held earlier in January, I believe. That's what the uh, um, 1427 says you're supposed to do is make that determination in January. That was properly noticed. The public knew that you were going to address allocations, but with this resolution, the public didn't know that you were going to address allocations. So. I, I would encourage I would encourage you to, again, rescind your motion. I understand you disagree with me, and that's fine. Uh, but I think for the uh, sake of the council and and uh, the integrity of fourteen twenty seven, I would I would recommend not uh, moving forward with the amendment. Okay, so I appreciate your advice, Mr. Graham. Certainly, it's it's not easy to do that, but I appreciate that. Um, I want to get to, if there's not a willingness to rescind that, then I want to get to a vote on the motion. So I have Councilors Abel, LeBeer, and Gutwein. And then um, I'd like to, if it's not going to be rescinded, take a vote, please. So have you opened the floor to me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, it, it is a conundrum. Uh, however, I will remind everyone that we had no public hearing on the enabling resolution passed a year ago. A resolution which puts guardrails and regulations on an ordinance. I know Ms. McKinney Brown will not completely agree with me, but you don't alter ordinances with resolutions. Rather, you do it with another ordinance. That way, there is a public hearing on the matter. We never had a public hearing on the enabling resolution. So, to be limiting the conversation now seems a bit disingenuous to me. Uh, so my second will stand if Mr. Beta's ordinance uh, uh, amendment stands. Okay. Thank you. And just a side note, I believe that the workshop is scheduled for August 16th. Oh. And that's another thing, pardon me. The workshop is supposed to be about vague and contradictory language. This has nothing to do with that. This would be uh, more of a... Uh, substantial change to the ordinance. So uh, I don't know where we decided that we would be making special, substantial changes in that uh, uh, workshop. That is certainly not the uh, uh, understanding that council's uh, consensus was reached on. Thank you. Councilor LeBeer, then Councilor Gutwein, and can we please take a vote on the amendment? Yes, sir. Just want to make a quick point. Um, you know, with, I appreciate Councilor Bita's, uh, you know, perspective on this, but but I do, you know, with all due respect, have a totally different perspective on it. 
Um, I disagree that, you know, the our process or the way we're um, dealing with the 1% somehow goes against uh, what the citizens voted for. Um, just reading uh, a provision that was actually on the ballot, um, it's pretty clear. It says the provisions of this chapter uh, shall apply to the issuance of building permits for all new dwelling units within the city of Lakewood, except structures located or to be located upon land that is designated blighted. So I just wanted to point that out to uh, citizens who might be listening. In my view, uh, it, it is clear that we are doing what the voters intended and we are encouraging uh, development in blighted areas. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Gutwein. Thank you, Mayor. A couple things. I just want to uh, fact check really quick. We, I recall we did have a public process for um, any the resolution involving blight the blight conversation i mean all of this has had a public process we had public meetings public comment am i wrong in remembering that that's my dog timing in as well if you can hear that um okay thank you just wanted to let the public know we we absolutely did have public process for that um and then uh yeah i just really wanted to echo kind of what Councillor lapierre said i think it's it's crystal clear language in chapter 1427 that the provisions of this chapter apply for all building um all building permits for all new dwelling units except upon land that is designated blighted um and then finally i feel a little bit confused because on one hand of this argument we're saying it's such a small deal we can make this amendment as part of a res resolution and then on the other hand we're saying this is such a substantial change to the growth cap that it can't even be part of our workshop discussion so that feels a little conflicting um i think that this is a big this would be a big change it is not appropriate to be part of the conversation of whether or not we are blighting a product uh, this particular property thank you all right, thank you. So there's a motion and a second on the amendment, on Councillor Bita's amendment. Uh, any other discussion? Would you please restate the amendment? So Councillor Johnson, it's the amendment that was emailed today and okay. I'll try to pull it up because it's quite long. So the amendment is recitals portion, whereas chapter 14-27 provides for no exemption of the 1% per year growth limitations provided therein, and whereas a designation, designation of blighted for the purposes of chapter 14.27 does not exempt this property from the 1% growth limits of said chapter 14.27. Now, therefore, and this will go to section four, the number of units ultimately permitted for this property shall be deducted from the total number of units permitted for that calendar year in which that project makes building permit applications as set forth in chapter 14.27.050 provided, comma, however, comma, that the project shall not be required to apply for allocations pursuant to chapter 14.27.090. That's the motion. Please cast your votes. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven nays, four ayes, the ayes being Abel, Beta, Springsteen, and Johnson. I did that backwards, but the opposite of the four ayes are the nays. It's hard on the screen to try to count all this sometimes. Okay, so we have original motion on the floor. Any other comments to the designation? Okay, I just wanna to touch on a couple things that were said. And, um, you know, this is, you know, gentrification is a big deal and, and the folks in this community mean a lot. And the city actually has spent a lot of money, whether it was the redo of Surfside Park 
the three million dollars for the sidewalk that took it down to Sixth Avenue, uh, the farm at Mount Air Park. Uh, there's a brand new affordable uh, Denver Housing Authority because that's a weird part of the city. But there's also been plans for years, the 20 minute neighborhood, where knowing that folks in this area may not have access to a vehicle, they would be able to walk to amenities within 20 minutes or ride the light rail. So I, I think it's important as we look at these projects, there's a lot of information out there and there's been a lot of planning that's been done in these areas to take into account the impacted nature of, of the folks that are living there and to make sure that they can thrive just like folks in other areas. And this piece of property, I mean, this is going on 14 years for me, I think, has been of subject all throughout. And Mr. Lonowitz called earlier when he was looking at doing West Line Villages, the, the first for sale project in that neighborhood in 50 years, he was ready to jump on an airplane and fly out and try to find the property owner just to try to discuss how could he work with the property owner to enhance it and to make it something more meaningful. At one time, we talked about expanding our urban renewal boundaries to include this property potentially because of the challenges that it faces. And I know this doesn't sit well with, with folks and, and anything related to the SGI is, is polarizing. And, and I think some folks see it one way and you heard, you know, that articulated and you heard another side articulated with how they view what was, was voted on. And so again, this isn't something that is of our purview other than what is before us. It's the blight designation and um, certainly meets that criteria. But I, I think this is an important project for the neighborhood. I feel that the answer that Councillor Bita was looking for is simply produ predictability. I know that there were housing units left on, but the city council turned down a project three times. And so when you're a developer looking at predictability to do a project and you need allocations, you see something like that, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? That may not be the reason that this project wouldn't go through. That starts to make folks squeamish about investing in our community. And this is the predictability through the SGI that is clearly stated that brings that to them. And if other folks won't say it, I will say it. They need to make sure that they have allocations that are available when they go to investment to take a risk on something like this. And that's why we're here tonight. And they're following the council rules. And if council, again, wants to change our rules, we certainly can do that. And um, for that reason, I think, you know, these conversations continue to get more challenging, but the answers aren't different. And so hopefully in August at a workshop, these are some of the things that we can start to, to look at so that going forward, it'd be quite different. So with that, if there's no more comments, please cast your votes. And this passes uh, nine eyes, two nays, the nays being Beta and Springsteen. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters tonight uh, Ms. Ricker and uh, Mr. Cavello, thank you for your investment in the community and uh, the, just the honest conversation and just the facts. We appreciate that. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you very, thank much. you very much. Okay, will the clerk please read item 13 into the record? Yes, item 13 is resolution 2021-33, approving an economic incentive of agreement with Hansen Studios Incorporated for an immersive holiday attraction, Camp Christmas at Heritage Lakewood Belmar and authorizing the city manager to sign the agreement. Okay, I'll now open the public hearing on resolution 2021-33. I imagine we will eventually have one presentation on both this and the next. They kind of go together. I will also note in Mr. Smith might in his presentation that there were comments and there was one question from um, uh, somebody that had to do with uh, why it's coming or why it's not staying and the price range and if there will be availability and I think we can address that as well and so I'll open public comment uh, three minutes if you could give us your name and address or name and ward uh, we will start your three minutes I'll give you your 30 second warning Again, this is for resolution 2021-33. 
star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute. We have four, three, seven, five. Four, three, seven, five, good evening. Hi, um, I was just wondering if it would be helpful to the public if for these that for these um, conversations, if, if whoever was presenting for the city or presenting on the you know the designation could present first and then do public comment before the um, council members gave their comment. That's how you know that's been that's done that way in other councils, and um, it's just helpful to be able to speak to what's going to be presented or to respond, you know, to what's presented rather than us going first and then having the presentation about it. So I didn't know if that was something that we could look at doing in the future. Um, but um, that's really all I, I have right now. Um, I, I tend to have like, you know, some things that I, based on the presentation from whoever, from the planning in the city, um, I tend to have stuff to say, but then there's no opportunity to do that. So that would just be helpful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Star nine. Resolution 2021-33. Okay. I will close public hearing. Certainly appreciate that comment. I Maybe we got off track, but sometimes we do do that. And uh, sometimes we don't. So with that, I'll turn over to uh, Mr. Smith again. And uh, he'll start our presentation. Well, thank you once again, uh, uh, Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen here in just a moment. Uh, I've got an unusual kind of combination between uh, PowerPoint and a video. So hopefully technologically, I'll be able to do all of the stuff that uh, needs to happen to make this go. So I've tested it the, uh, this afternoon and it worked well then. So let's just hope that we can continue on that same path. All right, I assume uh, everyone can see the uh, screen or no? Yep, see the screen out in front of you. Uh, before you, uh, members of the City Council, is resolution 2021-33 uh, regarding Camp Christmas. Uh, it's kind of an unusual sort of a, a moment for us because we're here in uh, one of the hottest parts of the summer talking about um, forward looking towards the, the holiday season. Um, and we have a unique opportunity here, one that we've uh, not done this uh, as typically as uh, as uh, we might have done some other things here, but it does involve the uh, Economic Development Fund, and I'll be talking a lot about that, but I'll also be talking about Camp Christmas itself. One of the things that uh, we did um, as we were talking to folks and, and businesses and whatnot um, was to talk about whether they thought this would be a helpful uh, a situation or a helpful presentation for the community uh, coming up on the holiday season. As you know, 2020 was a very muted holiday season, very challenging. Um, to work with. And so uh, a lot of the retailers and restaurants are looking for an opportunity to uh, do something uh, much, much uh, more grandiose than was allowed last year. And I think, quite frankly, a lot of our residents are uh, anxious uh, to do that as well. So with that in mind, um, let's talk a little bit about what would the, uh, the opportunity is. Uh, we have you this unique opportunity to attract, facilitate, and benefit from bringing this immersive holiday lights experience called Camp Christmas to Heritage Lakewood at Belmar Park. And again, it's easier if you know what it is or have been around it or, or at least have some inkling of uh, what it might be. Um, it's uh, an immersive extravaganza right there. It says that on the, uh, on the sticker. Uh, when the, uh, one of the reporters a couple of weeks ago asked me the question, this was the answer that I started with, was that Camp Christmas is a delightful and immersive uh, arts light historical holiday display backed by the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, the DCPA. And that starts to go to one of the uh, questions that you mentioned at the top there, Mayor, of, you know, why was it, why is it going to be or probably going to be more successful here if we adopt this uh, resolution? It's that the historical component of the, of the uh, Heritage Center is one of the things that's going to make this year's ex immersive uh, experience that, uh, that much more dramatic. I mentioned that the project attracted nearly 70,000 visitors uh, in the past, and it will likely do even better here in Lakewood for a variety of reasons. We can talk about that. Um, with their timed entry ticket sales, the flow of people is well managed. So the experience is uh, wonderful and completely unique. 
here's some uh, things that some other people said about Camp Christmas, and I thought I'd just put them up here. These are some of the uh, poll quotes from some of the magazines uh, uh, and newspapers around town. Uh, a daring work of interactive holiday art is what the Denver Post uh, talked about. More magical than we could have anticipated. 303 Magazine um, said that. Ho, 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 holy moly. Uh, we're happy campers at Camp Christmas. Uh, came from our friends over at Westward. Um, and it's a must-see for all ages is how 5280 uh, expressed what this is all about. Here's a picture of part of it. Uh, and we just decided that, you know, quite frankly, this isn't, this isn't nearly enough to make this uh, work. So I'm going to do a, a short video here real quick. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment. I'm going to do a little technical uh, stuff in the background. And I'm going to uh, bring this back up and then let me share my screen again. And I'll play for you a short video. It's about three minutes. And the video is of uh, Lonnie Hansen, um, the founder of the uh, Camp Christmas Extravaganza, talking about what the, uh, what the Camp Christmas was like a couple of years ago. When we get done with that, we'll uh, talk about a little bit about why it would be different over here. So, again, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go here and we're going to hope that it all comes together so you can hear it and see it all at the same time. <laughs> So you'll enter a Camp Christmas and go through the design sure. environments that Lonnie has created. You start in a queue line. Uh, people don't have to wait for more than 15 minutes. Because Robert, Robert didn't share. Spent up to 15 minutes. Robert, have a light tunnel in it. didn't share. So LED digitally programmed, which is fun, which is everybody's first selfie. You end up in Santa Bar, which is this bar that has over a thousand Santa. As we said earlier, the process it looks like Santa grew up. You enter an Egyptian tent in the 1950s. Beautiful. Uh, I apologize, folks. I, uh, I did not share it from the very beginning. Sorry, I had a little technical snafu. Let me go back to the beginning again. It's only about a two and a half, three minute long video. So I'd like you to get all of this. So I assume we can now see it up on the screen, correct? Okay, let me share it again. Thank you. So you'll enter a Camp Christmas and go through these designed environments that Lonnie has created. You start in a queue line. Uh, people don't have to wait for more than 15 minutes because it's a time entry. You spend up to 15 minutes in the line, which has a light tunnel in it. It's all LED digitally programmed, which is fun, which is everybody's first selfie. You end up in Santa Bar, which is this bar that has over a thousand Santa. As we said earlier, the process it looks like Santa grew up. You enter an Egyptian tent in the 1950s, beautiful substrate thing, and inside that is a black light horse which puts you in the present day. And then you walk down a long hallway, you end up in ancient Rome, where it is snowed, unusually. <laughs> This is sort of where we start the process, and there's a welcome statement um, in every area. There's a toast in every area. There are, there's an activity in each area. Moving to Renaissance, which is a vampire. We learn about mummy and wassail, and then we move into Baroque. This is where Marie Antoinette is commanding a life-size health whose antlers come um, branches down to the ceiling. Right past that, we actually jump to Santa's cabin, and that's the, actually the back side of Santa Bar. He's there on Saturday mornings from um, 10 to 1. We then go to Victorian. This is sort of the beginning of America Christmas. We move into Art Nouveau, which is just very sensuous and pretty and beautiful line. Art Deco, we're actually doing a Egyptian revival. Um, and then we invite you to go through Fairyland. There's a large forest, a fairy forest in the center of the room with uh, trees, and then a 20 foot diameter chandelier above that. The chandelier has 5,000 notes of RGB and it does a light show every 20 to 30 minutes. When you emerge from Fairyland, you'll be in Beach Bar and then into Atomic. This is where I think we all certainly have bits and pieces of our lives. This is where Christmas decorations and Christmas gifts in America. This is really sort of the height of that. And then mid century pink, this is a room that is not just decorated in pink, but it's pink. Everything is pink. Even black white photos in the space of art. Out of pinky space is right in Sugar Disco. This will celebrate the 70s and 80s. And then in the Christmas present, which has our light bulb tree, which is 123 or something years of light bulb, starting with the Edison light bulb, up to plasmas and uh, projection mapping across from it. And then the last selfie is being able to take a photo in front of Lucifer, who looks like he's being speared by it. 
and a carousel horse backed up against the, 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 the Rockies and a nice sunset, which is what it's all about in the first place, which is about light in the darkest time of the year. All right. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to restart that again and again. My apologies for um, not having it quite ready to go that, that same way. Bring up the uh, slideshow once again uh, so we can talk a little bit more about this. Got to share the screen and uh, we'll go from here. So obviously uh, talking about the, this is uh, very exciting and that's kind of the exciting part of this. And uh, and quite frankly, that's uh, the design for a year gone by or two years gone by, I should say, actually. And so the uh, designs or the thoughts for this year are actually even more grandiose and more amazing simply because of the canvas that we could use this year. And that is the Heritage Center. It's an incredible facility, as you all know, right here in Lakewood. And to be able to bring 80,000, maybe 100,000 people in those time groups to the uh, Heritage Center to see what they it can be done with that canvas is going to be uh, spectacular, at least we hope so if you you agree with us and we'll uh, keep on keep on working on that so what's the ask of city council let me get to, uh, right down to the point um we would be able to make available seven hundred thousand dollars i know that sounds like a lot of money from the economic development fund to facilitate the production of the camp christmas attraction at the heritage lakewood at belmar park we would contractually obligate hands and studios to produce the camp christmas uh, attraction at heritage lakewood at belmar park um, and we would be able to receive the reimbursement and revenues uh, generated by ticket sales up to 100% of that $700,000. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, that, that math in there because I know it went by it uh, real quickly. But specifically, the council has a couple of actions that will make this possible. The first is to approve this resolution, which allows us to enter into this agreement and move forward with that and make these funds available to, to work with the, uh, the project. And then the second part is to approve an ordinance, which allows for a supplemental budget appropriation. Had we known that we might be able to do this back when we were planning the budget back in August and September of last year, right in the thick of COVID, um, we might have been able to add it to our budget for this year. And then this conversation would be a little bit different. Didn't know we were going to have this opportunity, but it's one of the uh, most remarkable opportunities that I can think of um, for a number of reasons. And I'd like to share those with you right now. Why this attraction? Why would we want to get involved with this particular one as opposed to some other attraction? The first is that it has an established history um, with previous economic performance. Now, obviously, past economic performance is no guarantee of future economic performance. But as far as uh, sure things or things that are uh, solid, having a great history and a great ability to uh, work with those things is something that uh, is very attractive. Uh, as I mentioned, after that muted 2020 holiday celebration, I think people are really hungry for community attraction. I think they're hungry to, to get together with their neighbors, and there's really no better time of year than that than during the holiday season uh, when folks can get together. This year, hopefully, um, you'll be able to see the relatives and come out and, and be part of this uh, incredible attraction. Um, it promotes an existing city asset, inviting a whole new audience to the Heritage Center. Uh, obviously, part of the Heritage Center mission is to increase that uh, that visitorship and get folks out there to see this incredible museum. I can't even call it a museum, but interactive exhibit that uh, that the Heritage Center is. And we'd love to be able to get a whole new audience out there to check that out. Um, it supports our businesses in the uh, in the community with a steady stream of visitors. Uh, obviously, if to get to this event over at the Heritage Center, you've got to come in on, in on either Sixth Avenue or or Hamden, and you're moving up and down Wadsworth. You're heading past our our businesses and our restaurant. And uh, as I said in the uh, in the staff report, dinner and a movie is ubiquitous because that's what people do. They get together and they go to this incredible event. And it's not a movie; it's a completely immersive experience. Um, but they're going to say, hey, let's go to Camp Christmas and then let's go get dinner or let's get lunch and then go to Camp Christmas. Let's uh, uh, extend the, uh, that out and uh, uh, be part of the, uh, the community that way. So all of the businesses in the community can align their own promotions um, with this attraction. So you can see how businesses might say, hey, once you visited Camp Christmas, come on by. Um, and here's some reasons why you might want to be part of our business, whether that's in uh, whatever part of the city it might be. Uh, we get to leverage the marketing and technical expertise of the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Nobody is better at promoting arts events than the DCPA. 
they're, they're experts on it. They've been doing it for many, many years. They're the kind of folks that uh, have all of the emails of lots of the folks in the city. In fact, I think it's 66% of the folks in the in the city they have those emails into. They can reach out and say, this is an incredible event that's coming um, and get folks in there. This is a 42 day timeline. So it'll be going on for 42 days over there at the Heritage Center. So it's not a a weekend event or a day event sort of a thing. This is an opportunity to bring folks into the community for the entirety of that holiday season. Um, and that's a, that's a, you know incredible. The fourth quarter is the most active quarter in terms of consumer spending and, and sales. Um, as you know, a lot of folks refer to the Friday after Thanksgiving as Black Friday. And the reason they call it Black Friday is because retailers and restaurants get out of the red on their books into the black on that Thursday just because the activity is so strong in that six weeks that are so six or seven weeks towards uh, between Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas are critical for most of the uh, retailers. Which brings me to something that's been concerning us over in economic development quite a bit and that it motivates folks to step away from digital retail and brings them to the community for a very immersive experiential reason. This is something you can touch, you can see, you can be a part of it. You can't, uh, you know, it's not nearly as good looking at it digitally through the internet. Last year, folks did a lot of their shopping and their, their gathering and whatnot through the digital screen in front of them. We think this is an opportunity to get them out of that pattern and move them forward into being part of the community, part of our shops, part of our restaurants. Um, and the project's going to employ uh, 50 year plus artists and scholars, set builders, and support work uh, in, in Lakewood. This is one of those, uh, those statistics that's uh, somewhat some, sometimes hard to wrap your heads around. If you've ever stayed uh, through the credits of a movie and you see that long, long list of people that had to make that movie come together, sometimes you might be tempted to say, wow, that's a lot of people it took to make this movie happen. Well, a strong section of that is the set designers and the lighters and the artists and the designers and the people who had the vision to be able to put those actors and those cameras in an environment where they could actually film it. And that's what's going on with this particular attraction. Lots of folks involved with it, every detail thought out, every uh, uh, a stroke and painting and, and detail. Um, as you saw in the, uh, the vision there, one that really blows me away is the black and white photos in the pink room aren't really black and white, they're black and pink. And so you have to have folks that are, are, are figuring out how to manipulate those and make those come together to make the whole experience come together. So where would this money uh, come uh, from? Where would this money come? It comes from the Economic Development Fund, not the general fund. And that's very important because, as you know, over the last year, we've been talking about the general fund and how it's been battered around and beaten by the uh, COVID pandemic. The Economic Development Fund is a completely separate fund. It was started in 1985. It's about one that we've had all during that time, and it's funded through ongoing lodgers tax. So folks that are visiting the city, staying in our hotels, pay a lodgers tax for that experience. And so it's as if folks from all around the country, all around the world, are actually funding the economic development efforts for the city of Lakewood. This isn't a tax that most residents experience unless they stay in one of our hotels. There's been a large variety of projects over the years uh, using this fund. Uh, and in general, the purpose is to provide funds from the city to further the city's economic development goals. Now, you could choose to uh, spend $700,000 out of this fund and not have any expectation of any of that to be returned. That would be an eligible expense here. In this particular case, we've set up a, an agreement that we think is going to return those dollars back to us. And I'll talk just a little bit about how the fund's goals and what they include. They want to expand uh, we want to use these funds to expand the city's tax base and clearly that this uh, particular event would do that it's bringing visitors into our center uh, that would be spending dollars in our stores it's bringing employment into our uh, our community and those folks would then start to spend their dollars or parts of their dollars on paychecks on uh, eating in our restaurants uh, during the time that they're installing and getting the thing ready to go um, there's a strong commitment to use local uh, labor everywhere that we can um, it produce uh, one of the things the economic development fund wants to do is to produce a positive impact upon the community as a whole. I think this kind of an event would absolutely do that. It would provide a positive impact to have that Camp Christmas immersive presentation in Lakewood. Those two ideas together, um, just, just fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Camp Christmas, Lakewood, they go together. 
And then uh, this just comes straight from the ordinance for the Economic Development Fund, and that city council may authorize expenditures from the fund for the promotion of tourism and other services or programs related to attracting visitors to the city. This does that. So what I'm trying to express to you is, is that this fund was made for this kind of an opportunity. This opportunity is made even better simply because of the arrangement that we have here and, uh, and working with Mr. Hansen and his production team to make this come together. So I'll give a little bit on the expectations just kind of as a summary through here in terms of the actual contract. And of course the agreement was in part of your packet. So uh, many of you I'm sure have read through all of those uh, areas, but these are just the highlights in there. We make $700,000 available from the Economic Development Fund. Those would go towards the actual production costs of making Camp Christmas happen at the Heritage Center. Um, the Camp Christmas uh, production would be produced at HLBP. Uh, uh, HLBP receives rental payments and fees. So in other words, the production pays for those same sorts of things that other productions would be. There's no no free ride. There's a, that, that contract goes into place right away, returning a substantial dollar uh, return to the city in that way. 50 plus local artisans, jobs, crafting, making this thing come together. Uh, these hires spend at least part of their paychecks on local goods and services. That's how those models that you read about in the uh, uh, the materials, how they come up with, uh, oh, this could be a $6.5 million economic impact on here. I'm going to give you a couple of stats from the one two years ago where it was only uh, $3.4 million in economic impact using that same model. Why is it better in Lakewood? Well, it's better in Lakewood because the canvas is so much bigger. There's the opportunity to move from those buildings and there's an opportunity to be able to produce additional tickets so that more people can come and see this show over those 42 days. Uh, we've got strong commitments that the materials are locally sourced. So every time when they buy something locally, they put those dollars back into the economy and they circulate through. Um, tens of thousands of visitors at attend this attraction um, and they're visiting one of Lakewood's most highly rated facilities. They're coming in to check out a facility that we already know is fantastic, but made even just a little more fantastic because the, Chris, the Camp Christmas experience is layered over the top of the Heritage Center. Um, local businesses align their promotions with these businesses and they, visit, they benefit from all of the local visitors coming into the community. Uh, the entirety of the advance uh, is reimbursed, 100% of it. That's what our expectation is. Um, if it doesn't, then uh, that, you know that would be an expense that we would have on there. But for the most part, we have no reason to believe that it won't be because the budgets that we put together really indicate that that's what's going to happen. Local stores and restaurants receive the additional sales uh, uh, during one of the most crucial retail quarters of the year. That's the expectations that we would have on uh, this. So the next steps, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, um, would be to approve this resolution. It's 2021-33, which allows the city manager to enter into this agreement with Hands and Studios. And the next part is to approve Ordinance 2021-18, which is a supplemental budget appropriation that allows for the $700,000 to be available. And it also allows us to receive dollars back. Generally, we don't have a reception for dollars in the economic development. Uh, area. Uh, while I'm uh, sitting here, I just did want to talk a little bit about um, the public comments and the mayor alluded to those. There's a couple of questions that we can answer when we get to the questions uh, part of this mayor that you uh, referenced. Um, but there are 12 co uh, comments, all 12 comments in favor of this Camp Christmas arrangement. There are two letters um, that were sent over by all of the Colfax organizations. So 40 West, WCCA, the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, Colfax bid. Um, we got letters from all of the Alameda organizations. That's Alameda Connects and the Alameda Corridor Business Improvement Districts. We got uh, comments from uh, Belmar. The uh, the previous uh, manager for Belmar, Larry Herkel, uh, put in a comment that said that this would be just a fantastic uh, uh, thing for the Belmar community. And the new owners of Belmar, which we haven't talked too much about in the past, but um, they even weighed in and said yes. We would love to have this because they see this as an opportunity uh, to be successful. As I mentioned, uh, 12 others uh, uh, in favor of this uh, arrangement as well. There's a couple of questions uh, that we, like I mentioned, we can get to along the way. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap here with questions and discussions. Happy to talk about any of these elements and answer any questions as I, uh, as, uh, I believe uh, uh, 
Somebody may have mentioned uh, Lonnie Hansen is with us from Hansen Studios. He can answer questions about uh, Camp Christmas, the Camp Christmas production. Um, why they also have uh, Kit Newland and uh, Michelle Nearly who can answer questions about the Heritage Center and how that would all come together. Um, it was really a, a group effort to put this resolution uh, in front of you. So uh, Kit and Michelle and I have been working very hard to make this happen. Behind the scenes, city manager, our entire finance team <laughs> was involved with it at one point. So there's been a lot of thought and energy put into this particular resolution, this particular agreement, so that it can come before you for your thoughtful consideration. With that, I will close and happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you very much. Um, before we go to council questions, I want to address the one question that came through on Lakewood Speaks, so and then we'll go to council questions. So it looks like Ms. Herskovitz Hers Hers asked a couple questions that had to do with um, why, why is the Camp Christmas changing venues, which I think maybe that was addressed, but if not, also, um, what will the price of tickets for these events be? Um, will it be something that's affordable for families? So I don't, let's start with those two, and then I'll go to council. Well, I can start by uh, answering the questions to the best of my ability, but we may want to go to uh, Mr. Hansen and ask a little bit about the, uh, because that's kind of the technical parts of it. Um, well, you know, why is Camp Christmas moving over there? Uh, as I mentioned, it's an amazing uh, uh, canvas. Uh, all across this nation, these immersive art events are really fostered by where they happen, the, the environment in which they occur. The Lakewood uh, Heritage Center falls into the, the, the notion and the, and the message of, of Camp Christmas, I think, better than any other venue in the, in, the, uh, in the metro area. That's just my opinion. Mr. Hansen can agree with me or not agree with me, but I suspect he will agree with me. Um, and then the other part is, is, yeah, the tickets are designed to be affordable. The DCPA is very, uh, very much a part of accessibility for folks to come to the park. So I think uh, the ticket prices would be affordable for most families out here. Um, did I miss anything, uh, Mr. Hansen? Or Mr. Good evening, Robert. Robert. I, don't, I don't want to cut anybody off, but can, can we uh, take the slide down or presentation? Or? Oh, thank you for reminding me, sir. I apologize. Thanks. Thank you. Then uh, I can throw it back to Mr. Hansen for those particular questions from a resident, uh, uh, Lenore Herskovitz. Welcome, Mr. Hansen. Just to, um, yeah, just to cover a couple of those questions. Tickets start at $8. They will go up as high as the high 20s. Uh, it's a demand-based uh, ticketing pricing system. Um, so uh, very close to Christmas at a high demand, uh, could be in the high 20s, but we will start at $8 uh, at the beginning of the season. Uh, the mayor's lighting will still take place as a free event, although it will be reserved. People still need to reserve tickets, but it will still be a free event. Um, and um, we also will have programs built around underserved audiences uh, to make sure that people are not, uh, that, we, that we serve some of those underserved audiences, but, but if you come early in the season, uh, that's obviously the most affordable uh, time to come. We are coming to Lakewood because it's the most perfect place for Camp Christmas. We looked at many locations, um, were offered many locations, but uh, Heritage is just simply the best place because of the, we simply in Aurora uh, ran out of room and there was no, there was no possibility to we did 70,000 people. We, we were anticipating 86 to 115,000 uh, people, and there was just no room uh, to do the, the work there. Uh, and Heritage has obviously a lot more, a lot more room. Okay, thank you. So, Council, we don't have a motion yet, so I just want to stick with questions uh, for this round, please. So, Councilor Abel, Harrison, then Johnson. How much will this affect the mayor's tree lighting ceremony? Uh, will it reduce the number of local residents that will be able to attend that for free? How many did you have in the past, you know? Oh, uh, I'm sure Ms. Uh, Ms. Newland could give us a good uh, stab at that 
answer? Yes, good evening, Council. Um, I would say 100, maybe 150 would be the most. And I certainly think that we can accommodate all those people. And import, most importantly, um, that is the, we want to market and promote this event, the Mayor's Tree Lighting to our typical um, audience, our, our folks that generally enjoy that event. So that'll be an important piece of what we work with Lonnie on. Seems to me like there have been 100 or 150 people uh, lined up in the Heritage Center itself just to see Santa Claus. And then we have way upwards of 100 or 150 that come watch the uh, lighting ceremony and uh, take the tour around the park. So is there a better guess than... We can accommodate up to 500 people an hour. But, and so, okay. but what so, so the tree lighting being 500 people would be would be fine, and that and and capacity is all based on your maximum parking. I would I, I would guess that we usually have more than 500 people for the tree lighting. Uh, there was some hint there that all the materials would be bought in Lakewood and that uh, all of the support staff will be hired from Lakewood. Is that, is that the case? Well, we're a Lakewood company and we spend all of our money in Lakewood. We, we're citizens here and we run our studios here. I understand that. Were all of these people that are going to be employed, are they going to be from Lakewood? Whenever we can, but of course they'll be from the Denver metro area. We won't, we won't be bringing anybody in out of state but um they're going to most likely be from denver metro area okay but no idea how many of those might be from lakewood well there i there's got to be out of out of probably 40 people i would imagine that um at least you know 20 percent of them but i can't you know these are all specialists working on different things so it's, it's difficult for me to um uh, well, say who you know that would be about five people. The materials, are they all going to be bought here? Mr. Smith was talking they can be about this. Just locally, of, of course, we can't, you know, we don't, uh, a lot of these uh, materials are, have to come from overseas as well. So there's not, there are things that we cannot buy in Lakewood. Anything we can buy in Lakewood, we will. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the outreach for... Uh, Folks who might not be able to afford even the $8 tickets, can you tell me a little more about that? How many subsidized uh, visitors will there be? We need to look at the, at, the, at the groups that need to be served. We have certainly enough capacity in the first uh, weeks to accommodate um, any organized group that we can, that we can get together. Um, we have we saw in 2019 that we had a very high uh, percentage of of um, uh, of 41 percent of the people that went through Camp Christmas had not been to a DCPA uh, production, and so it sort of tells you that we do we are we are able to reach a very uh, diverse um, audience, um, and DCPA has a long commitment to serving underserved our uh, audiences and we will reach out to find what groups uh, particularly Lakewood uh, wants to use. Well, that's encouraging thank you uh, but again everyone that wants to come to the free tree lighting ceremony that we do every year with the mayor uh, officiating everyone who wants to come there for free will be accommodated as they have been in the past. Yes, Thank as you. they have in the past, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think Councilor Abel just wants to ride on the fire truck with Santa. Oh, uh, I want to ride on the fire truck with Santa so I can tell him that you haven't been a good boy this year. Have my coal, my coal loaded up. Uh, Councilor Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and what a great presentation. Just a quick question. Um, 
will all of this be inside inside the building the heritage um, center or will it be throughout some of the buildings there at the park because i think it'd be really cool to walk around outside but that's my idea no, that's that's the idea. It's an outdoor indoor event. Some of the buildings are that we've talked to Heritage about opening and that will be used. The interiors will be used. Some are not. So the Welcome Center, uh, Ethel and Gills, uh, the schoolhouse, the farmhouse, the barn, uh, the caretaker's house are, are all being opened on the inside as well as the outside. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. I think Mayor Pro Tem's son might have heard Santa and uh, saw him pop up for a minute. Councillor Johnson, go ahead. Thank you. Well, I am thrilled. We went to this in 2019 at the Stanley, and it's such a pleasure to meet you, Lonnie. The production was brilliant. Uh, uh, we, we absolutely loved it. It was a great evening. We've always had to go outside of Lakewood, like to the Stanley and then to Littleton for their parade. So I think this is a great thing. And now folks will have the new In-N-Out burger to eat at too as well, so that's good. I do have a few questions. How many years have you been putting this production on? Uh, Camp Christmas uh, inaugural year was 19. And then we, of course we went virtual in 2020. Before that, I designed and ran Houston Zoo Lights, the largest light show in America for seven years. And before that was with Neiman Marcus Corporate for a decade. And before that was downtown Denver in the Parade of Lights. And before that was Hong Kong. Uh, so I've been doing Christmas large events for 40 years. Oh, good. Okay. This is the second Camp Christmas, though, that you'll be putting together. Is that right? This is correct. Okay. Um, am I to understand that this will be an ongoing kind of thing at the Heritage Center every year, or will you be moving to different venues? What is the plan there? Well, there's, there, you know, the, there are plans for Camp Christmas to always happen. I would love to find a home that this could be an annual event um, but we need to um, be wildly successful first before we talk about that. Okay. Actually, I think it would be wonderful. And I don't know who the folks were that managed to get this. It's a real coup and it's a brilliant thing. Thank you for all the folks that were involved. Um, I do have a question. I think I saw it in the contract. God forbid if we go back into a serious lockdown and everything is basically stalled on your end and stalled on our end. Has there been any thought given to that and how that will be approached? I think there's been um, more thought given to that than anybody wants to uh, admit. Uh, of course, uh, you, the, but the, one of the reasons that we found Heritage was that I knew that we had outgrown Aurora I knew that there was going to be a great demand and that it had to be safe. And so we designed this event that if we were to even go to regulations that we were at uh, in the first few months of the pandemic, that we could still operate at a distance outdoor event and that we could, you know, in essence, only look through the windows and adjust the event to fit whatever protocols or whatever regulations were in place. If the entire world is gripped by another pandemic that none of us have foreseen at this point, then uh, the contracts go into force majeure and we've all uh, agreed to work very diligently to salvage what we can of the event. Perfect, thank you. Well, I would sure encourage everybody to go to this. I particularly liked how you had Christmas through the centuries. That was a lot of fun. Um, I just have to say this, and you all have to understand this. If we had Trolley 25 out there, imagine what a, <laughs> an accompaniment that would be to have a Santa Express at the same time. 
Um, I'm curious, Robert, after we spend the 700000 on this, how much will be left in the Economic Development Fund? There's a $9.2 million in the Economic Development Fund. There's two point mil. What is it again? $9.2 million. Oh, okay. So this, this doesn't jeopardize anything here. Um, I'm also curious, what was the upfront cost in the arrangement with the, the Stanley? Was it about a $700,000 arrangement as well? or um, The uh, DCPA budget in 2019 was $750,000. Uh, plus another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that I put in. Oh my! Okay. And last question: This is really going to draw parking. And uh, what kind of uh, plans are you making for that? Well, first of all, we we design all days, all hours, all capacities, and ticketing to your parking. So we only um, allow 300 people per hour to go through the site uh, during the weekdays and uh, week evenings. And we have a total capacity, maximum capacity of then 600 an hour um, on the evenings and weekends. We will be working very hard to get Belmar uh, to think about whether they want to shuttle people from their massive parking uh, to Camp Christmas because they could then uh, leverage those customers for the ice skating, restaurants, um, uh, bars, et cetera. Um, so, but again, we, we, have, we have based all of our numbers of a percentage of the capacity, which is all based on uh, parking that does not strain uh, the area's parking spaces. Okay. Uh, we, we plan on about an hour and 10 minute visit uh, right now, uh, Aurora in 19 was about a 51 minute visit. Well, for us, this was the highlight of 2019 and I surely encourage everybody to go. It, it is an awesome experience. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Springsteen. Hi there. This sounds really cool. So I, I'm glad to hear about it. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions. So there's the cost of setting it up. There's also a cost to the city in terms of, um, you know, extra policing, um, directing traffic, maybe I'm thinking insurance liability, uh, umbrella, whatever with regard to liability uh snow cleanup that sort of thing and i just wonder if that cost has been factored in in any way um and then i would love to see like a free night for i don't know you, you know people who just can't afford to pay or um kind of like they do at the zoo with boo at the zoo um, and, um, I don't know, homeless people, people who can't afford to pay. Uh, then, uh, another question I had was, so it sounds like you're doing daytime and night. So I wondered if, if there would be possibility for, for school kids in Lakewood to, to maybe have, um, excursions, uh, to this. And then, and then my last question was, what if we expanded this to Halloween as well and had the same? So we lost Councillor Springsteen. Um, so why don't we hold, hold that? And, and I guess maybe we can build off this, that question are, are, is this program eligible for the possibilities fund that the city of Lakewood has or 
Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, we could definitely make it make that a part of it for sure. Um, in regard to the question about um, ancillary costs, uh, insurance, and snow shoveling, and those kinds of um, those kinds of uh, the work that might need to be done, that's all incorporated into the rental agreement. That is part of use the use at the site at the Heritage Lakewood site. So there are no additional costs. It's it, that we don't recover. So the city recovers those costs. So let's um, let's just hold off, and so we can circle back when Councilor Springsteen gets back on. Are there any other questions uh, from Council? Okay. Well, I want to I want to wait to make sure we get those addressed, Councilor Gutwein. I just have comments, so I can wait till we do that. It's up to council if you want to go to comments right now, or or do you want to try to wait? Um, why don't we? You want me to read it in, and then you can do the comments. Yeah, that's fair. I move for the adoption of resolution twenty twenty one dash thirty three. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Councilor Gutwein, comments. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm thinking, you know, I usually don't start decorating and getting excited for Christmas until like at least November. But now I feel like this year is going to start earlier for me because it's just really exciting. Um, and I think that uh, this is exactly what those dollars are meant for. Um, as Robert said, I think that, you know, for me, um, this is just such a great opportunity to boost uh, our hardest hit businesses because our hardest hit businesses were our restaurants and our retail stores. And this is going to really, um, really give them a boost this year after a really, really hard year. Um, so I'm, I, I'm thrilled about it, to be honest with you. I think it's just going to be a really great economic driver. Um, and I think that our, you know, we've heard from our businesses. We've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years thinking, like, how can we help our small businesses through these times? And we're hearing that they want to do this. I think we should we should do it. We should listen to, to that. And, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thrilled that we get this opportunity and can't wait, um, can't wait to go. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor LeBear. Uh, yeah, I would just echo what Councillor Gutwein said. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for the community. I won't get into any of the technical uh, pieces of it, but I just want to say anecdotally, I went in 2019, my wife and I and uh, her parents and uh, we had a really great time. It was a lot of fun. I remember Councilor Johnson and I talking about it. And uh, it's exciting that it's in Lakewood. So looking forward to going again, hopefully this year. So thanks. All right. Councilor Springsteen, welcome back. We we saved the answers to your questions. Um, one answer was there is the Possibilities Fund, which is our program that helps provide funding for folks that can't afford these types of things and that can be made available. Um, Ms. Newland, you touched on, was it the question about maintenance and who who takes care of the, the costs associated with that? And that was the production takes care of that? Uh, it depends, but generally it would be city. We, we're not anticipating needing any police staff to control traffic, so we wouldn't have that. We do anticipate clearing sidewalks of snow, which would be our parks who generally do that anyway. Um, and then the production takes care of things like the trash pickup and that sort of thing. All of those ancillary, other ancillary maintenance type things are absorbed as a part of the contract with the site itself. So we, we recover the costs. And so we're in the comment phase. There is a motion in a second. Are there uh, any other comments? Um, I'm just going to make my comments so I don't comment on the ordinance. But I, I know that whenever we do these things and it's an incentive and it's taking a risk and it may not feel 
completely amazing to everyone. And it's that chance that we're all trying to take for something special in our community. And I think more than ever, we noticed during COVID that these things are so important and having that opportunity for the community to come together around an event. You know, we see how much the community loves cider days and uh, each year it continues to grow and grow. And there was a mention about Halloween. And in fact, on in, in 40 West Arts, they do a day of the dead ceremony and, and program, which continues to grow exponentially. And this is really the richness and the fabric. And we're honored to have such an incredible renowned artist in our community that is super excited to bring this to his hometown and take great pride in it. So um, there might be some growing pains and some learning but uh, I think we'll get through and I think the community is really gonna enjoy it. And I'm excited to support it. And I wanna thank uh, Ms. Newland and Mr. Smith. And I see Ms. Nearling on this. You've all worked really hard, uh, you know, kind of in a fast and a short amount of time on a far out concept. And uh, I thank you for, for all your hard work on this also. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say that I still believe in Santa. So I think this is the greatest idea since sliced bread and snowfall. So I'm ready to support it. Let's vote. Okay. Motion a second on resolution 2021-33. Uh, Please cast your votes. And that passes 11 ayes and zero nays. All right. So we'll move on to the next portion which is um, ordinance 2021-18. Will the clerk please read that into the record? Yes, uh, ordinance 0-2021-18 2021 authorizing a supplemental appropriation of $700,000 from the Economic Development Fund, the 2021 fiscal year to support the Camp Christmas Project at Heritage Lake Wood at Belmar. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, the presentation is essentially the same uh, that we had just heard. This is the appropriation. If there's anybody who wishes to comment, please press star nine. All right, I'll close public comment. And I'll ask for a motion. I move for the adoption of ordinance 2021-18 on second and final reading. Second. Motion and second, any comments? All right, seeing none, please cast your votes. That passes 11 ayes, zero nays. Congratulations, I'm thrilled to see nobody voted against Santa Claus. And uh, the Philadelphia Eagles are still the only entity that booed Santa Claus uh, to date. So I'm glad we didn't join them. Thank you all very much. And uh, Lonnie, we're really excited, appreciate you. All right, next we'll move into general business. We have two requests for council action. Uh, Councilor Gutwine, you are first, and then we have a second one by Councilors Johnson and Abel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just basically just wanted to ask if we could have a study session to get updates on where we are on bike safety, bike master plan, um, kind of what we can, what next steps could be. That's, that's the pitch. <laughs> so to facilitate that, certainly we, we had a, a very public uh, accident and, and we've been trying to address, you know, that we have a lot of uh, pedestrian accidents and there was a report that was done by Jay Hutchison that went out and kind of talked to some of this, as well as some some other reports. I don't know if if that's worth sending back out to council to get kind of the, that kind of information to get an understanding, or if you want to go forward with a bona fide study session. And if so, what areas do you do you want to try to call out and discuss? I personally do think it's worth having a discussion. Um, and part of my thinking on this is also that, you know, we recently went through a, um, a, a conversation about additional revenue sources. And, um, you know, 
I think that really talking about what potential costs could look like in order to increase potential, you know, pedestrian safety, bike safety, those kinds of things. I mean, we know it's going to cost additional money. Um, and just really having a, a picture in our head of what that looks like might help inform future conversations about budget and revenue and um, all of those things. So, you know, I think that um, the memo, of course, was really informative um, and I really appreciate that. I think that it is important um, just to have the opportunity to to talk about it and ask questions and see where we are, um, where we could go, what it would take to get there. Um, and uh, so that's why, you know, I think that it would be great to get one scheduled. I know we kind of book things or we, we have things booked out pretty far in advance. So I think, you know, it might not even be until the beginning of next year. Um, but this is something that also the council has had as a priority for at least a few years now um, about transportation safety and just really talking about what what we want to do moving forward. So that's that's what I would love to to see. Council, what say you, uh, Councilor Johnson? Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Goodwine, I really appreciate your spirit to do this. And I know that you're really trying to make a difference. I wonder if this is something, did the LAC ever pick this one up? I'm not, I don't know. Does anybody know? That's a good question, Councillor Johnson. I know that we just saw a pretty in-depth presentation from them on kind of pedestrian safety and road safety, which I think there were a lot of things that tied in with this, but I don't know more generally about like, or more specifically just only biking, but there was a lot of um, uh, recommendations that dealt with bike safety in the, those presentations that we saw a couple weeks ago, maybe or recently. Well, I'm wondering, since this one is a little bit different, if it would be worthwhile to send this to the LAC. It seems like, and maybe it's just me, a lot of things are sort of intuitive. People are sidetracked on their phone or their the radio or whatever and not paying enough attention. And um, that goes for both autos and the bikers. Uh, there's a responsibility on both sides. And I guess for me, the the real thing is education. And I'm not sure the best way to go about that. If we could start having uh, um, articles about that in the looking at Lakewood uh, regarding uh, bike safety and, and paying attention for the bikes by the autos and and frankly, for the bikers to have respect for the automobiles too. And, and just have more education. I, I don't know that we really need a study session on it. That's my thought. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I have Councillor uh, Labeer, Abel Harrison. I'll just be short. I would support a study session if the council is up for it. I do think uh, what you were talking about with finance ultimately is where the key and the heart of the issue is. It's are we gonna accrue and increase our capital improvement funds or not. Um, so I'm happy to have that discussion if the council is. Thanks. Uh, was it Councillor Abel, I think, and then Harrison? Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree, we need this conversation. We have been putting it off for far too long. We claim to be a walkable city and a bikeable city. We have a little ways to go before we can make those claims. And uh, bicycles especially. We have bicycle lanes in places that are a foot wide. And we have cars parked along both sides of the road in the bicycle lanes. So uh, even the full-size bike lanes are uh, difficult to uh, navigate. 
So uh, I, I think we need to have the conversation and I think we need to consider um, what it will cost us to really be the walkable, bikeable city we want to be and get ready to pony up for it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harrison, then Springsteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, ditto to what uh, Councillor Abel just said. Um, I would support, um, you know, a, a workshop or an update or whatever we need to do. Um, because exactly our master plan has been a master plan for a while. And I, I think we're making incremental changes, but I think we need to go back and know what changes have been made and what potentially could we change in the future and get a price tag so that we know how to prioritize. So I think it really makes sense to have some sort of uh, workshop on that. Thank you. Councilor Springsteen. Yeah, just a couple comments. Um, if you've been in the city of Denver lately, you see some significant changes that they've made there for biker and pedestrian safety. Um, uh, and so there might be something to, to be learned there. Um, I, I also have been hearing from a lot of constituents about concerns about you know, cars racing up Jewel, racing up Pierce, um, just feeling like general safety issues are at stake. And um, so I think for everybody's sake, this makes sense. I think this was a terrible tragedy that no matter what we had done may not have been avoidable because I think it involved a drunk driver, didn't it? But um that said there might be other circumstances where we could save somebody's kid and so i think it's worth a few hours of our time so thanks for bringing it up okay, okay. so i i have a little bit differing opinion i i certainly think this is something that you know could could or, or should be something of a conversation at the retreat only because it's so big, right? We're hearing transportation and cars, we're hearing bicycles, we're hearing pedestrians, we're hearing funding, right? And it is a priority. But, you know, I mean, what 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 exactly do we want to direct staff to prepare? Do you want to have the transportation, you know, safety talk about vehicles and about street racing? Do you want to look at the bicycle master plan and see what's unfunded? Do you want to look at the sidewalk connections and look at those? I mean, is this an all encompassing? And if so, I think it's, it's a much larger lift than potentially just a, a quick study session because it touches so many different areas. So I, I guess I'd ask Ms. Hodson, you know, from what you're hearing, you're, you're good at kind of summarizing this or, you know, giving us an expectation of when staff could potentially be ready to engage in something like this. Um, thank you. I was thinking the same. I was listening closely to the scope of what this conversation really would be at the study session. So the conversation that you're referring to, um, you had a presentation by the Civic Awareness Committee of the LAC. That was on April 19th. Um, and that's where we talked. Remember, they discussed all kinds of potential solutions for distracted driving um, and, and all of those things. If you'll remember, it was a really interesting presentation. Um, and then you did get the email reference referencing their recommendations and that came to you on May 17th. So, um, so and we're in the middle of budget season. And so the, our agendas for the rest of the year are pretty booked. If this is something that you would like to, us to really fast track I would have to go back with staff and find out once once we're able to kind of distill the scope of the project, I need to go back to staff and find out when we could get some preliminary work done um, to provide a presentation that would be thorough enough to give you good information as it relates to funding, et cetera. Um, so so I, we're real open. I've got the agenda here. If you want to think about dates. I know you have a sustainability update coming, which is taking a lot of, that'll be really thorough as well. 
it does that is that a higher priority or um you know does this does this usurp some of our other priorities or how do you want to how do you want to do this i really need staff needs more direction yeah i appreciate that so i have some more hands up i have uh mayor pro tem skilling uh Councilor franks and Councilor harris of the uh list that uh the mayor just listed um, I think one idea would be if we could look at the unfunded safety, I think is how you phrased it. If there are some unfunded safety concerns now, whether it be a problem child intersection, a place where the data is pointing to a higher rate of auto ped um, collision, what have you. If it's something that finite where we can really make a difference in the short term to prevent a tragedy from happening, I think that's certainly worth looking at. But I agree with what Kathy and the mayor were both saying that it, it was seems a bit broad, but I think that's what really the intent would be at the end of the day when you talk about master plans and vision zero and all that. At the end of the day, it's supposed to save people's lives. So maybe we just focus on what you said, Mayor, about the unfunded safety something but but specific projects maybe just a thought uh councillor franks harrison Gutwein. well for me pretty much ditto on that i think that we certainly want to know if there's particular intersections in certain areas where either lighting or uh, some kind of construct uh, is is causing uh, safety concerns and want to look at those if we need to do some special appropriations but what i i think is because we keep hearing this over and over again we may want to as a council come up with a very uh, specific ask for a presentation for our annual planning meeting that will then plug in all those necessary components because there we're talking about budget, we're talking about community priorities, and we certainly know that our community is deeply engaged in this. Uh, we have the biking community that's engaged, people who live in areas that feel like they don't have the level of safety for walking in that, but I think that we just, we have to cleave it into two, and, and as the mayor said, focus on any critical ones and I know that the data will point to maybe where we've got two or three high priority places in the city where we should put some immediate dollars and then come back with a specific request for a significant part of our annual planning preparation to be that we're fully informed on all of these topics in order for us then to feed in our priorities in a correct way which then doesn't usurp the planning that we've done because again i think we continue to do that where we continue to leapfrog things and it makes it very difficult for our staff to keep kind of keeping up with that so absolutely i want the community to hear we know it's a priority. Um, not all accidents are preventable in, in, the, in the way we would like them to be, but certainly we hear them and we want to focus on their safety, but we want to do it in a very holistic fashion where we include dollars that then will make those meaningful differences. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Harrison. Thank you. Um, what I would suggest is let's just look at the top five places throughout the city, uh, the top five accident places um, for both pedestrian and bicycles. And then we can come back and decide what we need to do, how that meshes in. That way we have a finite number. I agree with uh, what Councillor Franks just indicated that we need to have numbers. And then I think that that gives us a, a guideline. And then also I definitely include it with um, at retreat because Dana, this has been a really important thing for you for a really long time. And giving at retreat would give us more time or give you being a short timer, um, more time to actually be able to discuss that. So I think that that really makes sense. Thank you. All right, Councillor Gutwein, Springsteen, Vincent. Thank you. Um, you know, I really appreciate this conversation. I think uh, this, I think that kind of the way the conversation is going makes a lot of sense. And I think that um, will really help our community move forward. I think that, you know, my goal is not to derail our already stated, um, already stated goals. 
Um, it's just to to bring this back to the front again and kind of see where we are. So I, I actually love the idea of using kind of a data-driven approach to um, our safety concerns. Are there any that we can address? Um, what would that cost? And then a broader conversation, because I think we all recognize this isn't going, this like like many of the issues we deal with, this one isn't going to be an easy one or have an easy solution. So I think that really getting good information at the retreat um, makes a lot of sense. So I like those two, that two kind of track approach. Okay. Councilor Springsteen and Vincent. So, I mean, just putting this in perspective, we just okayed $700,000 for Christmas lights. Uh, I don't know how many thousands of dollars we spent on the big boom bash or how many thousands of dollars we spent to keep small children from, from using sparklers in the city of Lakewood. But um, I, I don't know why we always have to put off safety issues like this until the annual retreat where some of us aren't even all invited. So I say when it comes to safety, that's more important than budget. That's more important than a lot of things. And we should be able to prioritize things throughout the year that come out up Um especially if it, it it's costing people lives. Thanks. Thanks. Just a quick follow up. Everybody's invited to the retreat. Uh, Councilor Vincent. Yes. And just as another follow up too, we have already had uh, one of the biggest areas in the city identified that there has been money put to that would be the Colfax safety project. So that was one of the areas that was so identified. So I just want to make sure that that's incorporated into everything. Councilor Bita, then Councilor Franks, and I'd love to get some consensus and move to the next uh, request. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say real quick, I, I think it's always good to take a look at, you know, where you're at, where you've been, and, uh, you know, where you need to go or where you're going. And that was how I read uh, Councilor Gumwine's, uh request to begin with, was just sort of a kind of a status update. And it seems like it's morphed into some kind of a complex analysis here. And, and I, I think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to see us uh, reinvent the wheel here. We've already got a plan in place, and it's, you know, it's been there for a while. It's complicated. I think it's fairly comprehensive, and that's where we should start with that, and see if we're, as as the proposal says, you know, where are we at in that? Are we are we falling down somewhere? Are we not meeting our goals? Um, what are our goals? I think you start with that and then from there you can say okay well here's looks like we need to to uh take some corrective action we either need more information on this or more information on where the you know where the real hot spots are maybe and and has been suggested maybe we need some uh uh appropriations or whatever but we don't know that we don't we don't we don't even know for sure you know if we do have hot spots at least I don't. But I think it's, I think we start with what we have. That's the best place to start, and then and then let's take a look at it, and, and then and go from there instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and make make this uh, maybe way more than it needs to be. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Frank, bring us home. Thanks, Mayor Paul. I just wanted to stress that everybody on council absolutely cares about the community safety. We care about our pedestrians, our bicyclists, our motorists. We are absolutely able to prioritize. I just think that it's a matter of that we do have a lot of things in front of us and finding the most efficient way to handle them. We may not always agree as a group on the most efficient way, but I, I believe every single one of us has at our heart the care, the deep care about our community, and we're just trying to effectively use both our time, their time, and our resources 
uh, in the best manner possible. So I just wanted to state that for the community. Thank you. Okay. So what I've heard then is maybe a check-in with uh, what what staff would perceive as our most dangerous uh, pedestrian uh, bicycle uh, slash car. Uh, probably outside, certainly outside of the Colfax area as we're trying to address that. And then we could have that conversation. And, and if there's price tags, we can start to, to think about that. And I just want to be super cognizant also council. And we do send staff to do this and they do bring back financial information. They're just doing what we've asked. You know, certainly these are not, I mean, at the end of the day, these cost a lot of money and outside of the normal budget, it looks at other opportunity. I mean, we have hundreds of millions of dollars in unfunded needs throughout our whole system. And that takes a different kind of conversation rather than just what could we fund out of a budget? That's more long-term funding. And that's a serious conversation. That's not easy to have, but that's really what it comes down to. So Ms. Hodson, does that help give some more context? All right, thank you. All right, Councilors Abel and Johnson. Thank you. Well, Councillor John or Councillor Abel and I are back again. <laughs> Feel like a squeaky wheel here uh, to ask you once again to add a decibel level to our noise ordinance. Uh, Denver does have one. It's difficult to enforce something when you can't measure it. And this really was brought home to me a couple months ago. There's a construction site over on Holland and the um, the owner of the development and I were talking and there had been complaints about noise and so he wanted to know what exactly is the level of noise that uh, the city will tolerate and I told him we don't have a decibel number in that and basically you know he knew that it couldn't be enforced and even though people were complaining, it's kind of a moot point in all honesty. Um, I would just ask you to, to consider this. Um, we are becoming a much bigger city. Uh, there's more construction, different things at schools with bands, even um, in different homes. Uh, I know that we're looking at the short-term rentals there's sometimes issues with the noise that comes from those. But if you don't have a way to measure it, um, it, it really, it's, it's a mute point. Charlie, would you like to weigh in and help me out here? You're muted, Charlie. That's how we take care of noise on council. We just get muted. Um, <laughs> Most many cities have noise ordinances that are backed up by decibel limits. The last time we discussed this, uh, after I had uh, made my points, someone said, well, where do you measure it from? You can't get on people's property and measure it. Most cities that have a limit on noise tied to decibels specify that it is the decibel level at the property line. Well, on your own property, you can make all the noise you want if you keep all the noise on your property. But measured from the property line, it tells what kind of noise burden you're putting on your neighbors and others. So um, I think that there are, it's time for us to uh, recognize that there are noise limits that need to be enforced and to have a uh, measurable way to quantify those uh, noise limits. And that would be with a decibel reading at the property line. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. Uh, so council, this is something we talked about at the retreat and what did not move forward. I think there's also a employment component to the request, potentially an FTE. If I that, that right. Uh, when I was speaking with the city manager, she mentioned that 
um, this could require that. And, you know, there is the potential really that our code enforcement could use another FTE anyway. Uh, we are growing and, and their needs are getting bigger as well. So if it would need to take a look at an FTE, we could start out without one, but see if it's something that is necessary. Uh, certainly look at that. Am I, am I saying that in an honest way, Kathy? <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. I think we wouldn't start with hiring a person. Um, and if indeed this passes, just to see what kind of burden that puts on um, staff. That's a better way to do it. And then adjust accordingly. Thank you. Councilor Harrison. Um, my question would be, are we trying to fix a problem that we don't have? Um, are, are, would the police department, have they said they need this tool to be able to you know, give tickets out to people about noise. Um, I think noise might be a lot like pornography. When you when you hear it, you know it's loud. So I'm just wondering if that's something, are we answering a problem that the PD already has talked with us about or are we just creating an issue? Thank you. So I think I, some time ago, I think the chief did weigh in on this and talked about the reasonable limit that they felt was uh, manageable for them, but it has been some time. So, uh, Councilors uh, Springsteen and Abel. I, well, I just saw an email from a constituent today who was complaining about her neighbor playing music loud and there was a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and there wasn't any real resolution because the ordinance didn't apply exactly. And um, I guess what my takeaway from it was is how the heck do we enforce it? <laughs> you know, there's just no way to. So I, I think it's a good idea, both of you. I appreciate your bringing it forward, but I just... I guess I'm asking you, how do we, how do we enforce it? Um, and there's got to be a willingness to enforce as well. And so I, I already feel like a lot of things are falling by the wayside in enforcement in terms of those kind of violations. So I guess I'm just asking, is it worthwhile to pursue if we can't enforce it and so that's that's my honest question to you i'm not trying to um discourage you from this at all um actually i think that's an honest question and it certainly is something that we could ask other cities that have this you know just exactly how they are enforcing it at this point the police just go and say we've gotten a complaint you know, could you please keep the noise down? If they had a fine, um, and I'm not saying we're gonna go overboard on that, but certainly if there's a fine attached, it, it does kind of help the, the police to be able to uh, work with somebody. And frankly, um, and I don't mean to put it in this context, but if there is such loud noise and the police does determine that it's ongoing and um, it needs to have a ticket for a fine. It also helps pay for the police uh, action that it's going to take. But I think that's a great question. We ought to find out what the other cities are doing. Councilor Abel. A number of other cities have instituted uh, decibel levels as the uh, test for the noise ordinance. I recall way back when uh, somebody in Wheat Ridge complained that his neighbor was playing Christmas music too loud. Um, the guy got a ticket for it. I asked the, the mayor at the time, Jerry DiTulio, what is the standard? And he said, if somebody complains, 
then it's a violation. Uh, you can't do that. How many of us have not been awakened by somebody on a loud motorcycle or a uh, motor vehicle without a uh, muffler or with a glass pack on it? Uh, how many uh, mothers are upset about their babies being awakened from naps by loud noises? The police told us the reason they cannot enforce is because we have no decibel limit. We even had an attorney in and we asked him and he said, you can't enforce it unless you have a decibel limit. So if we're not going to have a means of enforcement, then we might as well strike our noise ordinance from the books. All right, council, do, is there a consensus to move this forward or not? Yeah, let me see what's wrong. So, um, so no, there's not a consensus. So, all right. Thank you for that. Councilor Goodwine, I'm sorry, your hand was up. No worries. Okay. All right. Anything else under general business? Mm -hmm. That we go to the court, we'll start at Ward 5. Wow, we're never first. Um, no report for me. Dana, do you have something? No report. That also caught me off guard. Like, did you say word five? Um, yeah, no report. So I'll go either word one or word four so I don't catch people off guard and then we'll go down that route. Word one, go ahead and then we'll go back up. Word one, go ahead. No report. Councilor Johnson, you're muted. Well, I had unmuted myself. Um, I just have something I'd like to pass on to you. After we decided not to put ID on shopping carts, I've actually gotten several cars calls one of them from a Walmart worker that has been trying to do the very same thing. I hope that you will all consider that at some point. They are a nuisance and they look like blight everywhere. If we had a way that we could just go up to the cart and there was a phone number, we could get it to be far more efficient than to have people call the city and most people don't even know to call the city. That's all I have to say. Or two. Um, yes, we have a housing policy commission meeting tomorrow. Um, I haven't heard still from some, um, but I believe we have enough to move forward. So um, we have a ward two, uh, that's at six o'clock tomorrow, and there will be a chance for public input, but primarily when we read the ordinance. We're just doing a couple of cleanup things. Um, <clears throat> And then the Ward 2 meeting is on Wednesday. It is going to be just a general overview of um, everything that we've conquered and come up with and what we've done. And if anybody wants to see some work that Lonnie has done, uh, the Lamar Station Plaza, or Lamar Station Plaza, I'm sorry, the Lamar Station has his art piece is the one that was selected there. And um, it's very nice if you want to see something that he's done that's in Lakewood. And that's all I have. I don't know what my co-counselor has. I don't have anything. We'll see y'all at the ward meeting. Thanks. Have a good night. Thanks. Ward three. No report. Well, I didn't get to give a report last week because my video got cut. Um, so I just wanted to announce that Governor Polis signed HB 21-1251, which is the legislation that I helped work on and draft over this past year on the appropriate use of chemical restraints. He signed it this past week. It's kind of a big deal. It's the first of its kind in the nation. Um, and Congressman Nagoose is trying to get a federal law along those lines as well. Um, 
it basically said ketamine should not be used by law enforcement and that and it bans waivers based on the made up concept of excited delirium. The AMA, APA, ASA all agree. And so, you know, I mean, I've heard people on this council saying that our police in Lakewood do not influence the use of ketamine or use it. That's flat wrong or we would not need a state law. We needed a state law and there's a reason for it. And I would just point you to a half hour KDVR program called Sedated on this issue. Um, Secondly, what I was going to say last week had to do with um, an article that came out in the Denver Post about uh, that there are only three municipalities out of 20 of the major ones in all of Colorado that don't have body cams yet. And this came out because of the really, really sad recent uh, shooting of a Arvada police officer and then a good Samaritan who was trying to help him. And everybody wished that there was body cam footage of all of this to help explain it. And um, so our city was directly criticized in this article for our failure to have body cams still. And I get it. Now we're under a state mandate, so we have to do it. And we're we're now dragging our feet along and trying to get those body cams. But here's what I'm going to say. This is good for cops and citizens. And we need to move it along quicker quicker than is planned. And the final thing I want to say is I keep having my video feed inexplicably cut during these meetings. And um, it happened at the last council meeting. It happened at my ward meeting. It happened today during executive session. And I wrote an email demanding that someone bring me a device that would work today because my Wi-Fi is working just fine. And magically my feed is working again. And I was able to make a report and talk tonight. And so I don't know what's going on, but I'm just reporting this to the public as I do every week. That's something weird is going on and I can't explain it. So, all right. Thanks everybody. Uh, for <laughs> No report. Nothing, nothing there, Pro Tem. Okay. Listen, I, I can't speak. In, in fact, I think it's just lunacy to think that somehow somebody's messing with a council member's feed. And normally I wouldn't even address it, but enough, okay? Every other council member is able to log in and participate in meetings. I did have a snafu during an executive session where I had to log back on. It does happen. Earlier in the evening, you were outside next to a brick wall and were asked to go inside and you had service. So if if there's troubles there, you're certainly welcome to come to City Hall and do your meetings. But to accuse anyone of trying to silence you via a Zoom platform is just insanity. And it's not true. And I wish you'd stop saying it, please. Okay, enough. All right, Mayor's Inspiration Awards, uh, they're due on the 15th, and this is a great opportunity for us to honor folks in the community. Want to thank the city for their firework display. They did an incredible job. And uh, I, I know that I got a lot of great compliments on the big boom bash. Unfortunately, I didn't see them, but I heard them. And it went on for a long time, and it sounded like it was spectacular. Um, And I also like to say that we got a lot of comments about fireworks and the lack of illegal fireworks. And I think this year was better. Now, certainly not perfect, but it was certainly better. So I wanna thank all the folks for that. Our In-N-Out Burger opened and I got a a snippet about how they've praised our police department and our public works team. 
And, you know, whenever they open, they have tremendous traffic issues. And uh, they were quoted as saying we were one of the best municipalities they've ever worked with. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. We have a few more weeks of this, but uh, that was really cool to hear. Um, and if, if you were out there today, I think some folks that I know of had a 25 minute wait and that was it. So they're moving them through and that's a, a big deal. I mentioned, I think Ms. Hodson, August 16th is the, the uh, workshop on um, the strategic growth initiative. Council, again, I'd ask that you, um, as we discussed and, and directed at the last meeting, either bring in some of those issues if you want to send them to me or to Travis, so that staff can be prepared to put that together for the conversation. An important meeting is coming up uh, next Tuesday, July 20th at Lakewood Cultural Center, which is kind of weird. There's actually going to be a live meeting, and that has to do with redrawing maps. It's that time. Uh, and so the um, Independent Redistricting Commission is having a meeting in Lakewood at 7 p.m. You can go to redistricting.colorado.gov to get information, to submit comments, and to look at uh, the proposed maps and see what that might hold in store for the city of Lakewood and for your constituents. That will also trickle down to our House districts, our Senate districts, and eventually find its way to city council. And I don't know what the time frame on something like that is, but there may need to be some adjustments in ward boundaries. Um, it's been, it's every decade, so I don't know what that'll be, but keep that in mind. And please, please, if you have a, an opportunity through your um, networks to push that out, redistricting.colorado.gov. It's an important conversation, especially with getting an eighth congressional seat I also had the opportunity to meet with the Salvation Army today. And if you are familiar, they have a location like three blocks east of Sheridan on Alameda. And they're actually looking at moving their headquarters from downtown Denver to that location. And why that's important for us is part of that location will provide 90 units for uh, transitional housing for families. So that's where families can go, I think, I think for up to three months and they are not Denver specific. They are Metro area and being this close to our community, they want to start and engage. So if you're interested in an introduction or um, any of your community groups, I think this ties in nicely with some of the efforts we're doing for homelessness, but they're going to be on a, a campaign to raise that. They just had a rezone within the city and County of Denver. So they now have their zoning in place. And then that'll be their first phase is to do that. So that's pretty uh, exciting and could be meaningful. And I'd be happy to connect you with them. And with that, I have nothing else. Ms. Hodson, do you have anything? No. Nope. Okay. So with that being said, we'll adjourn, excuse me, adjourn at 1040 PM. Thank you.